Uh, my name is Tom Johnson. I am from the Soaring Safety Foundation, and on behalf of Rich Carlson, who is our chairman, I'd like to thank you guys for having me here because it says a lot about the culture that you're doing. Uh, so I have to tell you a little bit about who I am so that I can develop a rapport with you all. I flew A6s in the Navy, uh, so I took the finest 1960s technology to a 1990s war. Uh, not that I'm bitter about that at all, but that's what I did. <laughs> and that's me landing at uh, San Antonio in the 757 that I fly for UPS. And up in the upper left right hand corner, that's my pits. If I really want to scare the living daylights out of myself, I go fly that thing. I've had that for 10 years and it still kicks my butt from one side of the airport to the other. And then that's my old mini Nimbus there. That was two days before I had my crash at seniors two years ago. So that's kind of who I am. I'm from Pensacola. I married a, a local. The last thing I wanted was a local. The last thing she wanted was a Navy pilot. So it worked out really well. <laughs> okay. So what we're going to talk about is first start off with the safety statistics. Then we're going to talk about complacency, briefings and checklists. Then we're going to do some scenario based training with a lot of things that you guys have been talking about. One of the really neat things about bringing somebody with a, with a uh, community perspective is I bring things that you don't understand about or have not been exposed to. One of the bad things is that I bring things that you have not been exposed to. And unfortunately, my pen will explode, so I ran out of things to do. But we also bring stickers that are on the back table by there, and we also bring sticky pads. You can write things down. So, Isabel, you had a question about the wing runner badge. What was it? Um, there was a pin that you were talking about earlier. Okay, so who's taking the wing runner course? Okay, who are the SSA instructors in here? Okay, <laughs> you're the SSA instructor. Do you know that you have, you're supposed to hand out the wing runner badge to the people who complete that who want it? You guys never sent them to me. <laughs> <laughs> I've got them all marked. I do. The answer is I do hand know. Out the, the, uh, SSA badge. Okay, you hand out the SSA badge and also the wing runner badge. There's a little ad that's in the Soaring magazine every couple months. You guys seen those silly ads that are in the magazine? Yeah, yeah that's me. So you realize what you're dealing with here. But if you talk to uh, Cynthia at the SSA, she'll send you a bag of them. Okay. We first made 500 thinking nobody's going to want them. Uh, a couple months ago, I sent them a thousand more. People really like them. So that's how you're going to get your badge. Okay. So again, picking on Isabella here, what flight are you supposed to start acting as PIC? Uh, first flight you ever take. First flight you ever take. The other students agree with that? No. Nod your heads yes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> One thing I learned in the Navy, if you, you don't learn to be a flight lead by flying wingman, you learn to be a really good wingman. You learn to be a flight lead by being a flight lead. You learn to be PIC by being a PIC. Okay. Uh, you talked about who can stop the operation. Anybody. What's that? Anyone. Anyone. Anybody. Say again. Anyone. Anyone. This is a revival meeting. Okay. I'm from the south. <laughs> okay. This is a revival meeting. We're going to talk about procedures and everything. But the thing is, if Isabel here just says, "I don't think this is safe," and goes to Stan or to Steve, is she going to be supported? Nod your head, yes. <laughs> okay? Nod your head, yes. Okay? That's real important. And one of the things that I picked up when you were talking about procedures is there's a little bit of disagreement on what you're supposed to do. Do you guys agree with that? Disagree? Sure. Do I got my head somewhere that's not supposed to be? Okay? So, yeah, that's one of the things that you want to have everybody be on the same page. Okay? And finally, Stan, who is in charge of the launch? Well, everybody can veto. Anybody can veto. P okay. PSCs are, are in charge of the launch, but anybody can veto. Okay. So, do you guys agree with that? Come on. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me. I'm not from here. You guys are your experts on your procedures. I'm just asking some questions. Who is in charge of the launch? Yeah, I think the yeah, <laughs> What's that, bro, Steve? No! No! <laughs> so who's in charge? It's your club. You guys tell me. Who's in charge? I've been, I, I, I try to promote the attitude that certain people are able to say go, and anybody can say no go. And it's the PICs who need to say go, and anybody can, can veto that. Okay, so the glider, the PIC glider has to be ready, correct? Mm -hmm. yes. The PIC of the tow plane has to be ready, correct? 
And the person running the ground operation has to be ready, correct? So which one of those three is the final authority? What do you guys think? The Trinity. <laughs> well, that's onion uh, from down New Orleans. That's onion, celery, and pepper. I don't know what it is up here, okay? But it really comes down to that the total buyout has to be satisfied that the person in charge on the ground and the pilot are ready to go, and nothing happens until you move your left hand forward. And then you go from there. But you need to have it clearly defined who is actually in charge. Because then you're already going to get... Our glider pilots tend to be strong personalities. Mostly. All pilots. What's that? All pilots are. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> so you're in a group full of pilots. Who's the most interesting person in the room? Huh. <laughs> I am. Okay. <laughs> and when you're talking, who's the most interesting person? <laughs> you are. So you get these clashes going on. So what you want to do is make sure, please, that you have a very clear and defined of who is in charge. Okay, and the, I should say the final thing, uh, locking the controls with the seat belts. Yeah, if you like replacing bushings in your control linkages, yeah, that's a great idea. But otherwise, it puts a lot of stress and uh, we really would ask you not to do that. Okay, so time to press on. Did I beat that to the ground well enough? Okay, good. All right, so your opinion matters. I want to hear what you guys have to say about your operation. I don't know much about your operation, but I, you guys do, and I'm going to ask questions, and I want you to tell me, okay? Yep. Yes. Okay, good, good. Okay, so one of the things that the, we are involved in with the SART Safety Foundation is the General Aviation Joint Safety Committee, and it's an FAA group that looks at the accidents and says, this is where the accidents are happening, this is the safety stuff we need to do, and these are the policies that we need as the FAA to implement. So loss of control in flight, that's the number one thing right there, 44%. What is loss of control? It's all from not control the plane anymore. Yeah. Well, you can't control the plane anymore. Why can't you control the plane anymore? Can you guys hear me without this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Why can't you control the plane? Lose spatial awareness. You lost situational awareness. What's that? Or lose confidence, perhaps. Well, not confidence. You're a pilot, so you're very confident, right? <laughs> okay, well, what is loss of control? It allowed the aircraft to get in a position where it can't fly. Okay. Yeah, equipment malfunctioned. Well, equipment malfunctioned is system component failure power plant or system component fail failure non-power plant. What is it? Airspeed, altitude, and idea of all of us. Okay, so I asked the airplane to do something. It doesn't do it. Right. And it didn't do what I thought I was asking it to do. Did the aircraft do exactly what I told it to do? Yes. Yes. Is it what I thought I told it to do? No. 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 <laughs> okay. So I'm on that turn to final, and I'm going to make a turn by putting in a boot of that in inside rudder. What's the glider say I want to do? Skid. Oh, he wants to sp or the pilot wants to spin. Let's go do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So it did exactly what I told it to do, but you have to understand to make that coordinated turn, we used to call loss of control stall spin. Stalls and spins are scary and dangerous. So now we call it loss of control, okay? So that's where that comes in. This little red bar here, any uh, people on experimental airplanes? Yeah, experimental amateur build. You've got lots of really neat things that should be on certified aircraft, right? Better. What's that? Better. They're better. Experimental amateur built make 5% of the aircraft in this country. How many, what percent of the accidents are they responsible for? 23.5%. Would you think anybody on 14th Street in DC is going to say, yeah, these guys really know what they're doing. We're going to put them in certified aircraft. Okay, if you wonder why things don't happen, that's why. Okay, so COVID wasn't responsible for this big unknown bar here, what's going on. Uh, people, system cone failure, power plant, the engine failed for whatever reason, okay? Uh, CFIT, controlled flight into terrain, that's not my landing, that's somebody flies into a ridge, spins in out on course, whatever, okay? Unattended flight in the IMC, this is a Pareto chart, are you familiar with those? What was the term? Pareto. <laughs> Pareto distribution. A Pareto distribution, there you go. Okay, you guys are all educated, you're Northwest people here. Okay, but all adds up to 100. 
and that's where it is, okay? But one of the problems is, is that 45 years ago when I started soaring, stall, spin, loss of control was the number one, peop number one thing killing people. 45 years later, it's the number one thing killing people. So we haven't made much advance in that, in that uh, part. And this accident data is for only three years. If you take it back 10 years, the chart looks almost exactly the same. If you take it back 20 years, it looks almost exactly the same. So we're putting a lot of effort. The accident rate in general aviation is actually driving down, but we're still killing ourselves for the same reason. Okay? So these are the fatal accidents in the soaring community. You see loss of control and stall. This is for a 20 year period. This is before we started calling stall loss of control. And we got that in there. Seafit, that's a big thing. People running into the ridge, people stalling and uh, running into the, the uh, pasture out on course. Uh, yeah, you can see the distribution there. The launch phase, stall. We're gonna talk about that. There's some ideas that Jonathan put out that we're gonna talk about. And congratulations, that is awesome that you got up there and do that. Because getting up in front of a bunch of pilots who have lots of opinions is very difficult, and you did well. Okay? And then the cruise phase, we're going to talk about that, and the landing phase. So this is the, since the Soaring Safety Foundation started, you can see that the number of accidents have come down. Why are they coming down? Less people are flying. Less flying. What's that? Less people are flying. Less flying, yeah. Okay? I'm 62. Who's younger in here than me? <laughs> Not many. Okay? So when I started doing this, I would say, I'm 48. Who's younger than me? Same number of hands would go up. So we're getting older. Okay? 1987, we killed 6.7 people a year. 2022, we killed 5.8. We are stubbornly killing six people a year. We can't have that. That's not good. Okay? I can replace, we can replace another glider. We can't replace you. And I would much rather have you sitting here, you know, telling me what a fool I am for bringing this stuff up than, you know, have you not here remembering the person, okay? So that's one of the things we need to uh, talk about. Well, clearly, clearly we can't have that because we are tolerating those deaths. Yes, we are in a lot of ways, and we'll talk about some of that here. Uh, yes. One of the things that we've noticed in this decline here is we know exactly what the numerator is. We really don't know what the denominator is, so we really don't know what the rate is. We sent cards out to your organization asking for the number of gliders, the number of operations, all this stuff. And we don't know if you send it back because it's anonymous. It comes on a little postcard. It's got an envelope on it or a stamp on it. You put it in, sends it off to Ron Ryde now, one of the trustees, and he compiles it. But if you guys have gotten that, I don't know who it goes to in your office there, but uh, please send it back. It helps a lot. Really, really, really smart people in this community uh, have said our exit rate is in line with general aviation. And they've also said it might be an order of magnitude higher. <laughs> so in line or 10 times higher, I don't know. It's somewhere in there. But we need, to, uh, we need to get a better handle on that. So where do all the accidents happen? Landing. Landing, yeah. I'm a Navy guy. If I ask a question, the answer is up here. OK? So 51% of them happen in the landing pattern. 12% happen out on course. <coughs> OK? And what we do in the Soaring Safety Foundation the NTSB says, I had an accident, it was in the takeoff phase, it gets put into the PT3 takeoff phase block. Real simple. We don't interpret the data, we just <coughs> take what the NTSB says and we pitch it whole into these. For quick terminology, PT3 is premature termination of tow? That is correct. Thank you. Oh. So that's Dean Carswell, if you remember him, that was his uh, thing, premature termination of the tow. And then 10% is unknown. COVID uh, has caused the NTSB to be really behind in classifying where the accidents are happening. So, we don't know. Okay, so where are all the uh, fatalities happening? Take off landing out. What's that? Landing out. Well, not really landing out, but out on course. So one of the things we talked about was the landing accidents. You guys have talked about, you've hit on the goal-oriented approach. That the goal is to put the glider down near that red line that Stan talked about. At some point, you want to intercept that glide path. I, if it's going to the high school, then going to the point, and then coming around, great. If it's intercepting, it's somewhere in there. But the whole point is to get that glider down where you all want it, okay? By the angle method, you know, the high school's not gonna go with you when you go to your outline field. So we use the angles. So we started beating on that, and we saw the fatalities come down. We didn't see the accidents come down. We saw that people are now running into things, okay? They're running into fence posts, stuff like that. 
Okay, but what we found out was that I, as instructor, said, Isabel, you need to go to the IP and fly the pattern. So Isabel got low on the wrong side of the field, so what did she do? She went to the IP. She went to the IP, okay, and then stalled and spun, and I'm going, boy, why did she do something stupid like that? Okay, when I realized it was because it was what I told her to do. Okay, so we're changing that. Then we started looking at the PT3 accidents. What's the first thing you do when you have a rope break? Maintain airspeed. What's that? Maintain airspeed. Fly the plane. What's that? <laughs> Speak to me. Fly the plane. ABA. Speak to me. ABA. ABA. What is ABA? Fly the aircraft. The nose is up, right? The rope goes away. What's the glider going to start to do? Slow down. Slow down. So what's the first thing I do? Nose down. Nose down. Push. <laughs> what's the first thing I don't do, which is what you said to do in your brief? Put a boot in. Now put a boot in. You said the first thing you do oh, is pull the release oh, to get rid of the rope. When we go to the crash site, we won't find the rope tucked to the glider. <laughs> okay? We don't want that. Okay? Fly the glider. I can tell you from personal experience, you can land with 200 feet of rope behind you and nothing will happen. And this is a thing that we're seeing in a lot of clubs around here. They're going, oh yeah, I've had a rope break. First thing I do is pull the release twice. No. The first thing you do is get the nose over and fly the glider. Okay? That's the first thing. So we started stressing that because what we saw was that people were doing stuff like that and they're fat, dumb, and happy, and the nose is up, and I'm pulling the release to make sure, and the next thing you know, the glider stalls, and there's a little bit of yaw. And what are the two elements I need to spin the aircraft? Stall and yaw. Glider says, oh, you want to spin? Let's go. Here we go. Okay? So we started pushing back on that, and the communities responded pretty well. And then we started looking at where the other accidents happened. This is, again, the unknown up here. The NTSB has not told us where people are killing themselves, but they're not here. And they're not here, so where are they? And elsewhere. What's that? Elsewhere. Okay, we're pilots. It can't be here, it can't be here, it can't be here. So where does it have to be? Come on, I'm making this simple for you. Where, it says right there at the very maybe. bottom if anyone sees. Oh, okay. Low altitude maneuvering plays a significant role. Thank you. See? Again, Navy pilot. Any Air Force pilots in here? Okay, so you don't have any military experience. <laughs> but yeah, you knew that was coming, right? Yeah. So what we're finding, what we're getting a lot of pushback from the racing community is that we're pushing, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, is you might have seen some articles in the magazine, the hard deck. Once you get down to that altitude, you're done. We're getting a lot of pushback from the racing community, but that is where we're seeing the accidents happen. Sir. Thank you. Expound on that, on the pushback you're getting, and why? Uh, one, one, I'm trying to take all the fun out of soaring by telling you that when you get down to 500 feet out on course in gusty conditions, that you should stop soaring and land. Two, I'm trying to take away your pilot and command authority because when you're out there doing something really dumb, that all the physics is against you and everything is against you, that you should probably consider a different course of action. That's the pushback we're getting, saying. You guys are out of your lane saying that we've identified a dangerous activity, we're recommending an alternative course, and you, they're saying, nah, we want to go out there, we want to have the opportunity to kill ourselves if we want to. Okay? The problem with that is, is that when you crash that $450,000 JS3 with a jet engine, who pays for it? Everybody. 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 So my insurance rates go up so that, you, so that they have the opportunity to go out there and do what they want. Yeah, I'm not too thrilled with that. And again, I can't get another one of them. I can get another JS3, but I can't get another one of them. And I'd rather have them than the glider. Okay? So we're, we're going to talk about that later on with what's going on with that. Okay? Cool. So now we have to decide where are we going to put our focus? Do we reduce the number of accidents or do we try and reduce the number of fatalities? Yes. What? <laughs> yes. I mean, yes, it, it's, it's binary. It has to be one or the other, right? Yes. <laughs> this one's trouble. <laughs> so what should we be focused on? You're the community. You tell me what we should focus on. Because I go around to other places and I say, I was out to those people in Hood River out there, and they said this is what we should focus on. So what do you think we should focus on? Total. Total. 
So if I drive this down, will it drive that down? Yeah. If I drive this down, will it drive that down? No. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Our, I think our focus should be to reduce the number of fatals. Again, we can get more equipment, we can't get more pilots. So, but we should do them in concert. So hopefully that's what the procedures that Jonathan went over, the stuff that Stan talked about, hopefully that's what is driving to get people on the same page, doing the same thing, talking about the same ideas and doing it the same way. Okay? Cool, so those were the number of soaring accidents. You can see that over the 40 years, we have about 35 accidents a year, not really changing. You can see that we stubbornly kill six people a year. Not really, because safety is the most boring subject. It's designed to take all the fun out of soaring. Yeah. Okay? The rate went up as the planes went down. Oh, I like that, yes. You've got a future. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, okay? So that's what we're seeing there. And then these are the launch accidents. This is where they're happening. The reds are the fatals, the blues are the non-fatals. And you can see we're doing about four to five launch accidents a year. Okay, so we started looking at this data really closely, and we said, why are people releasing? Is it a planned release or an unplanned release? Which one is it? What's that? Both, are planned. Both yeah. So the blue is the planned, the red is the unplanned. Okay? So I'm going to do rope break training, and at 250 feet, we're going to pull the rope, and we're going to do the procedures, and we're going to safely come back and land. Right? What's that? So half of those are planned or were, were planned training activities? More, more than half. Some cases, yeah. This is over a five-year period. I went back through the entire data that we had. It was remarkably close to 65%. Wow. Two out of every three PT3 accidents are on planned events. Wow. Okay, that's practicing bleeding. That's done. <laughs> okay, and then the really bad thing that came out of that was that we're killing one of five people in this community on planned events. Let that sink in. Who are the instructors in here? <laughs> okay, just one person had the courage to raise their hand. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna talk about that when we talk about the PT3, but, you know, good God. You know, what, what are we doing, okay? And it gets back to what Jonathan was talking about. There's a real strong undercurrent in this community that the first thing that happens when you have a unplanned rope break or a planned rope break is to pull the release. Wrong. That's not what gets taught here. What's that? That's not what gets taught here. Okay. What yeah. gets taught here is that there's, you're going to do your couple things, which is the instructor is going to pull it by surprise, and then the best, the first thing there's instructed to do or get ready to do is push okay and then and then follow from there okay but I, I'm just saying uh, I, I don't disagree that's why we're not in that statistic but the instructors here <laughs> we don't, I, I, we don't, I don't disagree with what you're saying so, I'm just so saying what, what I, I as a fly on the wall I sat out there and I heard him say the first thing you do is pull the release well I know you got a 16 year old <laughs> So I said Okay, they're defending him. Okay, good, good. <laughs> I, I, I will say, we, we, the discussion put a lot of emphasis on what about the rope, what about the rope, but yeah, but yeah, first thing is. Okay, me. so good. So yeah, I'm the guy from out of town, I'm the expert from out of town, and I'm wrong. So that's good. So thank you. <laughs> okay. But that's the kind of discussion I want you to have. Yeah. Real critical with each other, okay? Sure. So that Agreed. you don't have... You're not in that bucket there. That's a bad bucket to be in. Can you can you drill in a little on that, or, or at all? And we can move on if necessary. But um, but what's happening in those? Is it because people are not focusing on getting the nose down? Are they stalling, spinning in at low altitude? And do, do you know where? We can, is there any? Yes. Dig in on those. So you talked about pulling it on surprise, on the first rope break. <laughs> Should you brief it with this? With they're no longer students. You're a learner now, by the way. They're no longer students. They're learners. Should you make it a surprise, or should you brief it? Well, we brief them. That first one's and I'm saying, Isabel, we are going to go out and we're going to do a rope break at 300 feet HEL. I'm going to announce the rope is broken. I'll pull the release, and you are going to push the nose over. You're going to wind your watch. You're going to think about the plan we talked about. You're going to execute the procedures. You're going to turn around, you're going to find the runway, which is remarkably where we left it, and you're going to do a downwind landing. Okay? You will find 
that if you do that, the learners make the exact same mistakes in the exact same reason, in the exact same places for the exact same reasons as if you pulled it by surprise. Okay? But now you've done it in a training environment where the tow plane pilot has been briefed, the instructor's been briefed, the ground crew's been briefed, and the students has been briefed. Do you think that that will, do you think that that creates an environment for a better outcome? Well, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, once we've trained you on it, it's fair game. Okay. <laughs> you know, stand by to stand by. You know, it's going to be coming. But that's the thing that we advocate is doing it that way. Lots of comments. Lots. Okay. Go ahead. Do you advocate doing this in Condor because you can do it over and over and over? You and over. Condor is great. If you know how to use Condor and can do it, that's awesome. Because what is any flight simulation device? What is it? A tool. Practice. Okay. Uh, what are you training to do? Are you training to fly the aircraft or are you training to do the procedures? It's a procedure trainer. I don't care what level device it is. I don't care if it's a 757 I fly or a Condor. It's a procedure trainer. And use it as such. Oh, rope broke. Nose over. Okay, I've got airspeed. Yep, it's still the 27th. Yep, no, it's the 26th. Sorry about that. Okay. Now I start my turn. That took three seconds, right? If that three seconds is the difference between me getting back to the field and me not getting back to the field, what should I have done? Done the rope break a little higher. <laughs> okay. That's <good. laughs> See, that's why Stan is in charge. <laughs> okay. So, if that three seconds is the difference, what should I be doing? Another turn. I probably shouldn't be turning around. Okay. But take the time. Somebody said in the pre-discussion that when something happens, you don't want to think about what you're doing. You just want to do it. Ah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Think about what you're doing at all times. That's why you check your watch to make sure that it's still, it's 11.59 on the 26th. Take that second to mentally get together with yourself what you're doing. We talked about, what was it, Sully? Mm -hmm. What was the first thing they did in that, in that movie or that when it happened? Every NTSB accident, what does the pilot say? Oh, shit. Oh, shit. <laughs> okay, they oh. use one of their golf words, and then what do they say? <laughs> What happened? Right. And you have that couple seconds where you got to figure out what's happened, okay? So then you take that and you can collect yourself. Oh, yeah, I had a rope break. Oh, yeah, I briefed and I'm going to turn to the right because the wind is from the right. I got the nose over. I know what my speed is. I'm going to get in the turn. I'm going to come around. Does that make sense? Okay? So then we'll talk about that some more because this is good. Okay? So cruise flight accidents. Uh, this is where we really started looking at people spinning out on course and stalling. We had five accidents. We had four of them fatals. Uh, again, COVID as an outlier. We only had two last year. As the people in the racing community say, and I race gliders, don't get me wrong. They said, we haven't killed one in a contest in six years, so it's okay. Yeah. Uh, no, wrong. Okay, so this is what we're dealing with here. And the accidents, you can see they're still the most, but the fatalities are way down. Again, this was an outlier here. We had a couple people, uh, they had engine failures and they spun in, so it wasn't good. <coughs> but that's where we're at with the accident statistics. And then the unknown cause, again, COVID is driving this block right here. Are these, okay. it, are these numbers from last year? These numbers are starting at 27 up to 2089 and get them for you if you want. <coughs> but you can see that they're remarkably consistent. Okay. So this by the region, you guys are in what, region eight here? So you're kind of middle of the pack for accidents and fatalities. That's, uh, you know, it's what it is. Uh, the people down in Texas didn't like the fact that they were winning when it came to uh, having the number of fatals down there. They didn't really appreciate that. How is that weighted by the number of flights in each region, though? That, again, right. we don't know the denominator. Right. All I know so is that. So that's just number. So that, that's a raw number. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I, there may not be as many flights in the Northwest as there are in yeah. New York. Yeah. <laughs> I, again, I don't know. You know, the people in the uh, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, they're not too happy with this number here. Sir? Do you have any information on whether those were people who were local to the area or whether, for instance, in Texas, people went down to do OLC? And we have not broken that out. Like that. All we know is that somewhere in Region 10, somebody crashed a glider. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's one of the problems that we have is that it's only five of us and four advisors 
and we don't really have the manpower to uh, break a lot of this out. Rich Carlson is very good uh, at getting computers to do this stuff, but we don't have the uh, manpower in a lot of ways. Okay? So any questions on the accident statistics? Sir? Does uh, Costello ever give you any <coughs> feedback? You know, we talk about accidents that get reported in the NTSB, but there's a lot more that never get reported, but yet may or may not go to the insurance companies. And I was just wondering if uh, AIG or Costello or whatever insurance company-wise ever gives you any feedback of how many claims they've paid out for this last year. So the relationship between the Soaring Safety Foundation, the Soaring Society of America, AIG, and Costello is very proprietary. Costello will brief us to the extent that Pat feels comfortable on what the claims are. And we know that when there's an accident, there's going to be a claim. What we don't know is that somebody busted a canopy and Pat paid for it and all that. We work with AIG to develop processes. The fact that we are here, we can say to AIG, we came to Hood River and we talked to these guys. They like that. Okay. Remember, insurance companies are in the business to collect premiums, not to make payouts. Okay. And they're pretty happy with the job that Pat does and they're happy with the job that we do. What they are very, very concerned about is the two JS3s with the jet sustainers that run into each other out on course at a contest, and now they have a million dollar claim. Okay, they are very concerned about that uh, because our group insurance program is really not built to support that. It's built to support the $20,000 233 or the $8,000 126. It's not built to support the $400,000 JS. Okay, does that answer your question? Does that answer your question? I'm sorry. Okay. So I have a question. Sure. Sorry. Um, so last year six people were killed? Is that what you said? Uh, so in total? That's what I thought. Last year we killed six people. Okay, and then, but there were like nine regions where they had the fatality of those that showed on your last slide. I'm just wondering how you did those. This is for a 12 year period, 13 year period, excuse me. Yeah. We, again, we're soaring people, so we tend to be really high energy, high intelligence people. We know that one year is going to be an aberration, so we look at long-term trends. Okay, sir. So do you uh, get any idea from the insurance company whether they will deny coverage to someone um, because of the type of airplane they choose to fly? Uh, again, they're in the business to make money. So there is a fellow in our club who in the last seven years has crashed three gliders, and Pat will not insure him until he shows that he's flown five years without crashing a glider. I had my accident down in Seminole two years ago. They won't insure me to fly a different, another, they won't insure me to add on another glider for five years because I had the accident. So again, they're in the business to make money. And he's trying to keep the, he does a very good job and he works very hard to keep the rates low. So, Did sir. you include that uh, fellow who had the MI in flight in the unknown fatality, even though he landed the glider, or the glider landed itself at this point? Yes, that's in the unknown. If you're familiar with that, there was a fellow who was in down at uh, Texas Soaring, I believe. Mm -hmm. And where is, what's his name? And they started looking and they found the glider a mile or so short of the runway. Canopy closed, landing gear down, spoilers deployed, flaps set, with the pilot dead in the cockpit strapped in. God was his co-pilot. There you go. God was, yeah, so, you know, what happened, who knows? But, you know, we don't know. So that's in the unknown category. Um, I'm part of one Valley Swarming Club, and we have got two uh, groves, um, 103 groves, and we had a couple hard landing so the other day I did some research on it and he has the website as far as like the list of <coughs> known accidents with this particular aircraft and as I was reading through all of the different accident scenarios about 80% of those were power pilots with high amount of hours but low amount of hours in flyers. Okay. Can you talk about that and why? So for my instructors again, what's the hardest part about teaching somebody who's flown Cessnas and Cherokees? Wave their feet up. Well, that's okay. What's the second hardest part? <laughs> what do they want to do at 30 feet? Flare. 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 
What do you do on a glider at 30 feet? Don't flutter. Don't to touch nothing. Everything is looking good. <laughs> okay? So what they're doing is they're starting to get slow, and once they get slow, they come down through the wind gradient, and the glider says, I don't like this, so we're going to come on down. Okay, so that leads to the hard landing. When you read through those accidents, did you notice that a lot of them said, I encountered a heavy sink on final? Yes. Do you think that was heavy sink? No. That was the wind gradient. Remember that accident in Dallas with the L-1011? Where they flew through the, the microburst? The microburst? Yeah. They knew it was coming. They briefed it in the cockpit. They had 120,000 pounds of thrust in their hand, and it still didn't bring them out of that. If you fly through a wind gradient, you are coming down. Period. End of story. Well, they, okay. they had to slow for a little bit in front of them. So yeah, they were, but so they, they were on were speed. 150 knots and going into, a, a, what, you know, lightning and they. Oh, yeah. They, they should have went around. They should have went around. Should have, would have, could have, but, you know, they were, they, yeah. you know. They never had, they never been in a microburst, and so yep. it caught them. So it caught them. But the thing is, when you read those accidents, look for that, look for that, because yeah. that's the wind gradient. How do you defeat a wind gradient? What is a wind gradient? Well, we have a big wind gradient here in the summertime because we get a lot of wind. It's typically okay. blowing 20 knots, and, um, and you'll find that uh, when you're coming in on final, uh, it's a lot of times you get 20 feet off the ground, you're in heavy sink because of the wind gradient. It's slow. Well, again, you're not in heavy sink. Well, it is very, very this is very important. Okay. Okay, well, <laughs> you, you no longer have the headwind that you get when you get closer to the ground because the ground friction is causing the wind to slow down and now okay. you're facing so, lower and, and, airspeed. And you know, my daughter doesn't like it when I talk about this stuff because I'm OCD and I say, no, the letters are in the wrong order, it should be CDO, okay? But you're coming down, how much, you're at 500 feet and you're coming down at 400 feet a minute, how much lift is your wing making? One glider's worth. One glider's worth. So now I come down and I fly through a wind gradient and now I've got one knot less of airspeed. How much lift is the wing making? Not enough. What's that? Not enough. One sixtieth less or whatever. Well, well, whatever. Yeah. So which way does the glider say? Oh, I don't have enough lift. Which way does it start to go? Down. 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 Okay. That's where the sink comes. That's where the perception of sink comes in. Okay. How do you, how do you mitigate that? Speed. 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 Okay. Number one, you plan on it being there. Then what do you do? Number two. What's that? Carry extra speed. You can carry extra well, speed, but the have spoilers so you can put them away if necessary. You got okay. somewhere to go with your spoilers. So you're using your spoilers for glide path control, and I'm coming down. Oh, there's the wind gradient. What do I do with my left hand? Do I push it forward? Do I leave it where it is, or do I pull it back? Forward. What do I do with my right hand? Forward, same or back? Both go forward. Okay, should you plan on the wind gradient being there on your next flight? Yes. yes. How about the flight after that? Yes. yes. What happens if the wind gradient's not there? What? Don't touch nothing. Yeah. Good. Okay? If you plan on it being there and it doesn't happen, oh well. If you don't plan on it being there and it does happen, yeah, now you got the hard landing you're talking about. Okay? So look at these things analytically and remember, am I the type of pilot who's going to go, yep, I screwed up. No. I didn't compensate for the wind gradient. I ran into heavy sink. That's why I landed hard. What do you think a pilot's going to do? <laughs> Claim it. What's that? Claim heavy sink. Claim ignorance, right? Okay. And for some of us, that's easier than others. And one of the things I ask is, who here has made a really dumb mistake in a glider? I should see every Not hand yet. go Not up. Yet. Not yet. <laughs> Not, you will. Not yet. You will. Okay. You know, I invested in that fund and it grew 10% last year, so it's going to grow 10% next year, right? <laughs> okay. But complacency is expectations. You expect something to happen. I did it this way before. It's going to happen the same way again. Okay. Does the FAA have a fancy term for that? Yes, they do. <laughs> okay, what is expectation bias? 
going to be the same. Yeah, just Acting on what you think is going to happen instead of what does happen. There you go. Say that again. Acting on what you think is going to happen instead of what does happen. I'm operating my 767 out of Newark. They've got 22 right closed. So every night we taxi down the length of the runway, cross 22 right, hold short of 22 left. Friday night, five minutes before we taxi, they open 22 right. They clear us to taxi to 22 right. What do I do? Cross it. I cross the runway. <laughs> the controller laughed. He said, "Yeah, we were wondering who the first one was going to be." To do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I say, yeah, okay. So that's expectation bias. Be ready for that, okay? When you're tired, are you more susceptible to this? Yes. What about when you're stressed out? Yes. Okay? Yeah, things like that, okay? You talked about not having enough people to run the launch, okay? All that stuff feeds into your expectation bias. So be ready for that, okay? Nice picture. Oh, wow, okay. It's almost like somebody put some effort into making this. Okay? Is aviation work and operations repetitive? Yes. yes. Why is it repetitive? Because we try to do it the same way every time. Right, because we're not smart people. We're very intelligent people, but we're necessarily not smart people. If I change my takeoff procedure every time, do I have a takeoff procedure? No. Okay, so we do it the same way every time. And every time it works, I build that expectation bias. Okay? Uh -huh. So, as you become complacent, what's another word for complacent there? Comfortable. Comfortable. What else? Expectation bias. Expectation bias. How about proficient? I become really proficient at this operation. Do I stop thinking about what's going on? There's a neat little slide we had that I didn't have in here. But it shows that in March and April, the accident rate's really low. What happens in August and September? Complacency. Complacency sets in and it goes up because I've been operating safely all year. Do I need to worry about this? No. Okay. So that's what we want you to think about there is that the launch tomorrow is the same as the first launch you've ever done. Treat it like that. Okay. And then you'll avoid that. So again, past performance is no guarantee of future results. That makes sense? Okay. Just because you can swim doesn't mean you can't drop. That's right, okay? Yes. Okay? So what are the things you can do to fight complacency? Be aware of the dangers of complacency. <laughs> <laughs> you are vulnerable to <laughs> Good. We see? gave this at uh, least. <laughs> okay. You ever seen those radio ads called 1-800-251-3415? That's 1-800-251-3415. Why do they do that? Repetition. Repetition. It gets it in your brain, okay? Get your mantra going. I am vulnerable. I am stupid. I am going to do something stupid. Don't do something stupid. Okay? So treat that. What's that? You're laughing. Why are you laughing? This is serious stuff. <laughs> Don't laugh. I mean, you, okay. could, you could just fail a couple of times, so assure yourself that. You can fail. <laughs> you can do that by yourself. What do I mean by always follow the checklist for the phase of flight? Beyond what it What do I mean? Well, what do I mean by always follow the checklist for the phase of flight? There are quite a few checklists. Sir. Checklist, well, nothing has a memory like a checklist. Okay. I mean, well, we're going to talk about checklists here. We'll get into that. But yes, do the appropriate checklist for the appropriate phase. Sir? And checklists don't skip over anything. Checklists don't skip over anything, but do I skip over things? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's checklist discipline, and we'll talk about that. Okay. Continually assess and evaluate the risk in what you're doing. How do you do that? Think about what can go wrong. Think about what can go wrong. When I come into the landing pattern, what are one of the things that I want to do? Look around. Look around. Where's that windsock? Not in a great place. Not in a great place. <laughs> so do I check that? Well, you check the one that we know is better. Okay. Like, so sure yeah. Make this. sure your your gear's down. <laughs> is that assessing and evaluating the risk by knowing where the wind is from? How about looking for traffic? How about listening for traffic? That's what we mean. It should be a continuing process. 
When you get back from a two-hour soaring flight, should you be fresh and fit, or should you be mentally exhausted? Probably will be exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, can I make a comment on that? Sure, there? always, please. Uh, Jonathan, can you make a comment on your use of oxygen at, at a freight end? It, it relates okay. to, to safety after long flights. Um, I just feel comment. better after, I mean, especially after thermaling for five hours. Um, I get lightheaded if I don't use oxygen. Mm -hmm. It just makes me feel better overall. Yeah, okay. Use you know the before. What's that? You use it before your flight. You can use it before the flight. You can pre-oxygenate. You know, the facility where I live, when they want us to go to sleep, they turn the oxygen down at night, so that helps us fall asleep. <laughs> Same thing, if you want to be awake, get on the oxygen and it wakes you up. Okay. <laughs> what about setting your own personal safety limits? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oxygen at 10,000. The rules Oxy say, rule say 12, I go on at 10. Okay. Is that prudent? Secret no. ballot? No, it's not. Why is that? It's too high. Okay. <laughs> you should be going, going oxygen lower. Yeah. Okay. There's data out there that says you need to go in oxygen lower. Okay. That is a great debate to have. What do you guys think of that? Well, yeah. if you live at 10,000 feet, I guess you'd be in oxygen day and night, right? <laughs> <laughs> a, lot of the, a lot of the data that was taken that showed you need oxygen was for very fit fighter pilots at 25 at the peak of their physical fitness. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily applicable to us in an aging crowd. Well, it's really it's a pulse oxymeter. Climatized, we're in greater acclimatized here. I think here we're at sea level, so I'm, I'm on board with you. We should have it at five stars. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in spite of what they show you on Top Gun, where these guys are flying around with their maps off. Yeah, that's BS. <laughs> all well, I, I won't say it's BS. All I've ever <laughs> <laughs> before you take off, you got the mask on while you're going down the runway. Is that correct? While we're going down the catapult, yes. And you know, you go off the end, landing gear comes up, mask comes off, you know, because it's very uncomfortable. But yes, when you're doing, when we're doing, you know, when we were doing things that required our full attention, we had the masks on. And I will say that soaring, especially cross-country soaring, is the closest thing that I've ever done in general aviation to tactical flying. <laughs> you have to treat it like you're tactically flying, and it's remarkably similar. The takeoff and the landing are something you do to get to the thing in the middle, which is low altitude run into the target, you know, drop, you know, spend taxpayer money, you know, making holes in the dirt. Same thing, you're out on course going from wherever you're going to wherever you're going. It's tactical flying. Is that, is that, in, that in, is that in the nature of that because you are constantly engaged in the task as opposed to being at cruise at, at Four, you know, four three zero or something like that. Right. Yeah. You know, we're at thirty five thousand feet. Yeah. You know, and I'm reading my magazine. You know, as opposed to I'm at three thousand feet soaring. Constantly engaged. You're constantly engaging. Yeah. You should be making five to six decisions a minute when you're out on course. If you're not, you're getting behind, sir. So, how do people feel about using a pulse oximeter to take the guesswork out of oxygen? Everybody's physiologically different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? What do you guys the, think? The problem with pulse oximeters is that. Some of them quit working at altitudes over about 10,000 feet. Mm -hmm. Some of them are temperature sensitive. And so you need to have a pulse ox that's been documented at least up to 20,000 feet so that it will function in the low teens where you definitely need your oxygen to be monitored. And uh, there are some new ones. Uh, some of the ones that are like a watch uh, may work well. Uh, some of them that entirely case, encase a finger might work well. But the little clip-on ones, like you see in the ER, like I said, some of them are only good to about 10,000 feet and they quit. So wow. kind of look into that and, and poke around to see on the description page anyway, how high can you use this thing? And uh, some of the mountaineering uh, websites uh, might be a good place to start as well. Okay, sir. Um, another issue that I found for me, and I can't speak for anybody else, is I don't know when I become hypoxic. I don't. I couldn't find any of the symptoms. I thought I was just fine. I'm going through the altitude chamber. Um, so I got one with an audible alarm because I don't know when I will become hypoxic. I, I never saw the symptoms. Anybody do the high altitude chamber? Kind of remarkable, isn't it? It's amazing. It's amazing. I was that dumb and happy. I couldn't add two plus three. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I was <laughs> Okay. The most dramatic thing we did was uh, they let us get hypoxic, and then the instructor passed around some cards. 
and uh, this bar had a uh, it looked like a grayscale, circular grayscale, went from black lightly around to white. And you know, I thought, well, okay, what's this all about? Then he goes, okay, put your mask on. Put your mask on. All of a sudden, that grayscale turned into a color wheel. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> just like that. It's like, wow. Oh, yeah, man. it's amazing. <laughs> Go ahead. The FAA has a portable uh, traveling altitude simulator chamber. Basically, they take the oxygen out of it to make you goofy. But you have to get a third class medical uh, to have that, to take that. And I don't believe the military is doing the altitude chamber stuff for civilians much anymore. Yeah. So that's something to look into. Uh, personally, my oxygen system and my gliders, uh, it's like a nuclear weapon. You know, you can dial when it's going to come on. And I set it to come on at 8,000 feet, like you recommend. And all of a sudden, you're flying, and the next thing you know, you breathe in, you hear this little click, and you feel some coolness in your nose. Okay, that's how I know it's working. Okay, uh, how do I learn from the mistakes of others? Talk about them. Talk about them. Tell stories. Tell stories. Yes. You're Great training stories. good. You're going to do good. <laughs> how else do you do it? Uh, watch videos of well, people crashing. <laughs> potential to be a Navy pilot because we just need up the crash videos. We thought, man, that just reinforces the fact that it's not going to happen to me because it happened to you. What do you think about that? Uh, yeah. Wrong. That's a risk. Sir. Uh, you got to kind of internalize what they could have done different, what could have solved that problem rather than just realizing what went wrong. Okay. Can you put yourself in their position to say, what would I have done? Yeah. Not really. Try. Not, not without all the information. Do you have enough information to get a decent idea? Yeah, you know, I mean, even if it's a photo or a video, you can put yourself in that situation and go, what would I have done? What would I have done had this person done this or if the situation was this? Believe it or not, that is scenario-based training. Okay? You guys know what a Rolodex is? Rolodex? <laughs> <laughs> That's something you flip through and you pull the card out and go, oh yeah, this is how I call Steve. You know, this is his number. But it's that whole concept that you've thought about this stuff before it happens to you, and now you go, oh yeah, I pull that card. Oh yeah, this is what I do in this situation. Now you have a plan. So one of the things that I think was most interesting that came out of Phil Anderson's the tow plane that went down up in northern Washington was when the article was done in the asset in, in the Soaring magazine. He'd been practicing for that contingency for years, the loss of the stick. Mm -hmm. And you know, I thought it was great airmanship. And when it came out that he'd been practicing rudder and trim flying for years, it wasn't just learning from mistakes. It was actually practicing mm -hmm. those those things. And he got him back to the air, he got him back to the airport safely. Okay. Yeah. That's good, you know. So you're ready for what you practice. Okay? So overcome complacency. Someone talked about vigilance in uh, one of the talks. And vigilance is the key, you know. Use checklists for the phase of flight. Know and understand your procedures. That's kind of why I was talking about what your launch procedure is, who's in charge. If everybody knows what the procedure is, then you're all on the same page. If half of you think it should be one way and half of you think it should be the other way, how many procedures do you have? None. <laughs> okay? It's just, I do it this way because that's the way I want to do it. And that doesn't work too well. Okay? Immediately stop what you're doing and set your situation. We talked about that with you guys getting into Steve's office, Stan's office, supporting the, op the idea that Isabel here as a student can say stop and you're going to stop and you're going to assess the situation. And that's good. Uh, trust but verify your work. What's that mean? Don't just assume you did it right. Twice. Measure, twice, cut once. Measure twice, cut once. I got the landing gear down. I put it down. Is it okay if I look up and reach up and make sure that the landing gear in my champ hearth is extended? Extend my arm, extend the landing gear. Does that work? Okay, trust but verify. Okay, uh, we're coming up on lunch here in a few minutes, but so we'll press on. I just remember that success breeds complacency. Complacency breeds failure. That means that only the paranoid will survive. <laughs> okay, so be paranoid, okay? OCD and paranoid. Good combination. I like it. Okay, so do you use checklists in a glider? Yes. yes. Why? Because you know what you're doing. So I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. I don't need a checklist. So you forget part of what you know. Well, I can forget what I know, but why do I use a checklist? Why? Avoid complacency. Avoid complacency. Good. He's paying attention. Okay. Do you guys agree with that? 
My instructors, does the FAA mandate the use of checklists? Yes. Where does it mandate that? <laughs> Part 91. Wrong. How about the practical test standards? Okay. And what they say is the use of checklists when accomplishing the elements of the objective, where it would be either unsafe or impractical, especially in single pilot operations. So what does that mean? Are you in single pilot operations? What's that? Yes. You agree? Disagree? Single pilot operations? Yes. Yeah. I'm asking you. I'm putting you on the spot. I'm picking on you. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I go up with another pilot, so we can bounce ideas off. So how many pilot in command is in the aircraft? One. 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 How many required crew members are in your ASK-21? One. 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 So you are single pilot operations. Okay. You are training to be pilot in command. I, as the instructor behind you, I'm just there to make sure that you don't, one, harm me, two, harm the glider, and three, harm yourself. Okay? So that's the idea there. And then it says, a review of the checklist after the elements have been accomplished would be appropriate. What that means is that when you're in the air, should you be reading a checklist? No. no. Single pilot operations? No. How about on the ground? Yes. 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 Okay? So it gets back to the idea that checklist leads to a new phase of flight. Okay? I've assembled the guy, I pulled the glider out of the trailer, now I put it together. Is there an assembly checklist? Yeah. Yes. Okay, should do it. So now I've got it assembled. Now I'm getting ready to enter the cockpit. Should I do that checklist? Okay. Again, I'm going to a new phase of flight, I enter a new checklist. Okay? This is uh, from the U.S. Story team. This is all the things they do before they even get to pulling the glider out of the trailer. That's the checklist. Okay, again, OCD people, paranoid people, you can get your checklist to be that detailed if you want. Should it be? Why not? I don't know, that's your personal choice. Which things don't you want to forget? <laughs> okay, does that all make sense? Yeah, okay, so that's checklist. And again, this comes right out of the PTS. So, how do you do your checklist? Is it a to-do list or is it a checklist? It's a verification list. Okay. So are you call, do, respond, or are you challenge, verify, respond? What's the difference? One, one, one uh, creates the actions and one checks the status. Okay. So how do I do call, do, respond? You say what you're going to do, you do it, and then... You say what you're going to do, and then you do it. So I get in the glider, I sit down, altimeter set, 600 feet. Belts on, click, 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 click. Okay? Controls checked. Is that the way you want to do it? How do you do it in the airline? How do you do it at the military? You respond back again saying, I've done it. Is that? You get in the aircraft. It's a verification. You get in the aircraft, you sit down in the glider, you pop my fat butt in the glider, I strap myself in. I start over here, whatever control it is, I start working around each control, I touch each control, each instrument, all the way around, make sure it's where I want that particular item to be. Now I'm ready to enter the checklist. Which is verification at this point. Which is verification. My altimeter is set to 600 feet. Roger, it's set to 600 feet. My belts are on and secure. Yes, they're on and secure. Why are we advocating that you do it that way? It becomes more of a routine. What else? So you know what you're doing rather than just reading an instruction book. Okay. That's very German, though. It's just a German glider, it's correct? <laughs> if you read the book, as we do it, correct? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. How many times am I checking it when I do call to respond? Once. 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 How many times am I checking it when I do challenge verification response? Twice. Twice. I told you I'm not smart. Am I more likely to catch an error if I do it twice than if I do it once? That's why we advocate it, okay? The military does it, the airlines do it. Their accident rate's pretty low, and maybe there's something to it. So what's That's the second one? Is that checklist or to-do? This is the to-do, so I call, do, respond. This okay. is my challenge. Verification is checking. Okay. That's a fancy word for checking. So, you in college yet? You in college? 
No, no, okay. You'll learn when in college words when you go there. Hopefully you'll go to a good Big Ten school, not one of those Pac-10 schools out here, okay? My son went to Cal, okay, so. <laughs> okay, so but that's the idea. You check it twice instead of checking it once. So now when you're doing your ABC check, when it gets to controls, what are you checking? Free and clear. Okay, I heard they, I heard free and clear, I heard that they work. What are you checking? You also want to check the sense. You want to make sure they're moving in the proper direction. Yeah, free, clear, and proper operation. Okay. So I'm sitting in the glider. I'm sitting in the front of that K21, and I pull back on the stick. How do I know that the elevator went? Which way did it go? Yeah, it was up. What's that? Yeah, I pull back on the stick. Which way did the elevator go? Yeah, hopefully it went up. Okay, yeah. hopefully it went up. But how, where should I have checked that? Before you got in. Probably. Before I got in. What am I checking when I... Move the controls. Not banging the instructor's knees. The instructor's They're not hitting my fat thighs in the back seat there, okay? That you have full control movement, that you don't have a belt in the way. And that's real important that when you get to a checklist item, you actually know what you're checking, okay? CB sift, a lot of people like it. I hate it. Ballast. I'm sitting in the cockpit. Should I be checking that I put the ballast in the aircraft while I'm sitting in the cockpit? No. That's something I should have done before I got in, okay? But, but let me take an exception there, but with the verification attitude, isn't it appropriate to verify that you did the right thing back when you... Yes, it is. Okay. Damn, he's listening. Oh. <laughs> okay. But that's the whole concept of that. Again, know what you're checking, know why you're checking it, know what you're looking for, know what the... Uh, deviation is, okay? Is it, is it safe to follow up on that and say, oh, sure. checking ballast shouldn't be done for the first time when you're in the cockpit on the runway? Yes. Okay. 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 So the FAA says that written checklists are best used on the ground. That's assembly, pre-flight, before any cockpit takeoff. Anyone know what this picture is? Yep, 17. P17. Yeah. Prototype P17. Okay, what happened? They left the elevator oh, control on. They left the elevator yeah. control, yeah. control lock on. What did the Army say about the B-17? We're not buying it. We're not buying it. It's too complicated. It can't be flown. <laughs> so Boeing said, maybe we should make a checklist and come up with that. Was it flown as a single pilot or was it flown as a dual pilot operation? The guy, the pilot's name was Cowboy Johnson. Uh -oh. What's that tell you about what kind of pilot he was? <laughs> okay. So they realized they had to fly a big complicated machine as a crew with checklists. Remarkably, it worked. Okay. So that's where it comes from. But these are best used on the ground. Okay? You're in a single pilot resource management environment. Okay? That means when you're in that SPRM environment, who are your resources? <laughs> What's that? Okay, I'm sorry. That's who is that? That's Mark. Okay, and that's Kelly. Okay, so yeah. Whatever. Okay. But you're in a single pilot resource management. Who are your resources? Or what are your resources? Everything available to you in the cockpit. What's that? Everything available to you in the cockpit, including Every people and passengers. And people, passengers? What about Stan on the ground? Is he a resource? Yep, yep, yep. How is he a resource? Stan, what's the wind doing down there? Okay. Anything that you can talk about. When you're on tow, is the tow pilot a resource? What about when you're getting ready to go? Is the ground person doing this? Are they a resource? Everybody that can make an input into the decision that you are making is a resource. People have talked about aviate, navigate, communicate before. What does that mean? Caps prioritization. You fly the aircraft first and foremost. Okay. Say that again, sister. <laughs> <laughs> you fly the aircraft first and foremost before anything else. Before anything else, yes. Okay. Fly the glider. Fly the aircraft. Then worry about navigating. What's the last thing you do? Talk on the radio. What's the most? What's the thing that most pilots really love to do? <laughs> <laughs> Talk on the radio. Okay. Saying they don't like to fly. Yes. What's that? Are you saying they don't like to fly? Again, who is the most interesting person in the room? Because Me. Right. You all want to hear what I have to say, so I'm going to say it on the radio. Okay. <laughs> do I really care that you're turning base? No. Would I rather have you fly the airplane? on a good base turn to final turn, or would I rather have you tell me, the people on the ground, that you're turning base? Again, I'm gonna take a slight exception here, which is that you, as a safety concerned person, don't care if I'm turning base. 
but the power plane who's on left downwind also potentially uh, uh, coming into the absolutely is important for him, could be important for him to be, to get situational awareness from the radio call that I'm on base. Okay. So what I would say to that is I enter downwind and I go, glider entering the downwind for runway 25, be advised, you know that aircraft that's out there, we're going to be turning inside you. Talk to them. Yeah. Engage with them. Absolutely. Because if I say, turning, ba turning downwind, turning base, turning final, have I communicated with them? Remember, communication just, is a two-way stream. Yeah, that's just a broadcast. Okay, you're just broadcasting, you know, okay? So use written checklists as time allows. Memorize the checklist and the landing. Why do you memorize the checklist like the landing checklist for when you're in the air? <laughs> Heavily tasked you time. You better not be reading it when you're trying to land. Do I want to be walking along, flying along at 60 knots, reading? <laughs> <coughs> Sahara Fuad. Do I want to do that? Tree. What's that? Tree. Tree? What's tree? <laughs> no, tree. Okay, good. Good. See, uh, yeah. you got it. You're too smart there. Okay? But Fustal, how long does it take to go? I don't have flaps. The undercarriage is welded down. My speed is 55. The trim is set. The you know, air brakes work. I'm looking out for other traffic. Let's go land. How long did that take? A couple seconds. Seven seconds, eight seconds, okay? You know, so <coughs> that's what you need to do to have those things ready, okay? Uh, one last, uh, is the food here yet? We'll run through the briefing here real quick. Uh, are you, as a glider pilot, required to do any briefings? Yes. As a private or a student, are you? Private, student, whatever. Required to know any and all information pertaining to the safety of the flight? Okay, 91.7, good. Is that a briefing? Are you required to do a brief with anybody, anything before you go fly? Yes, yeah, briefing. Toe pilot. Toe pilot. Toe pilot because it's formation flight. What's that? Tow pilot because it's a formation flight. Tow pilot, yes, formation flight, no. Well, because a tow, a tow is a kind of formation flight, isn't it? Isn't that why? You have to do a tow pilot brief, 91.309. The pilot towing in the aircraft have agreed upon a general course of action, including takeoff, release signals, air speeds, and emergency procedures. Do you do that prior to every flight? Yes. Yes. Nod your heads, yes. <laughs> okay, do you do that? Yes. Yeah. Do they do that? Yes. What, don't smile, tell me. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Does it have to be where I get out of the glider, the tow plane gets out of the glider, and we sit down and talk it? Or can I go, I want to go over there, 3,000 feet, standard signal, standard emergencies. Yeah. Have you met the letter and the spirit of the law? Yeah. So what is a good tow pilot brief? How long should a good tow pilot brief take? As long as required to communicate the information. Okay, yeah, if I'm towing, it may take a while, okay? But what we recommend is talk about altitude, area, airspeed, signals, emergencies, triple ASE. Take me southeast. 65 knots, 3,000 feet, standard, sig standard club signals, standard emergencies. Five seconds. Did I meet the spirit and the letter of their 91309? Yes. Okay. Do I need to expound on that at all? Maybe. Maybe. Unless, unless there's any departures. Okay. Any departures. Well, is that a general agreed upon course of action? We could be better at it. We could be better at it, sure. You can make it as big as you want to, or you can make it as brief as you want to, but you still have to do it. Okay? Are you required to give a passenger briefing? Yes. Who's been on a flight where the flight attendant is up there doing it? Why do they do that? Required. It's required by FAR 91107 and 91519. Okay? Are you required, when you take someone for a ride, to give a passenger briefing? Yes. yes. See the red asterisks? You're supposed to tell them, where's the fire extinguisher in your K-21? <laughs> huh? You don't have one. Oh, well, okay. But these are all the things you're supposed to talk to them about, and the FAA says these are the things you should talk to them about. Okay, it's not advisory circular, it's an article in the FAA Safety Briefing Magazine. But what to expect, explain the instruments, what they can and can't touch, the controls. The big thing is, how do they get out? Have you ever watched someone go for a ride and the instructor or the ride pilot hops out and the person in the front <laughs> is just sitting there like, 
What do I do? You ever seen that? Okay, tell them how to get out, okay? Big thing, what to do if they feel ill. Anyone ever been ill in an airplane? No? Learn how to do air combat maneuvering in the A4. I wasn't doing very well, so I said, TJ, get in the back seat, let's go fly. And, well, I spent three quarters of the flight puking up in the back because the other person was slamming around. So, so what do I do if I get ill, okay? Those things. And make sure you ask them if they have any questions. Okay? Create the good environment. And see, that's what we want, is happy, briefed passengers. <laughs> We, we want that to be the way they look when they get back down. Too. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. So uh, we're up to the point where we're starting to talk about scenario-based training. What do you want to do, Steve? Do you guys want to take a break? Got a lunch in here yet, so just keep on going. Okay. Do you guys need to take a break, bio break, coffee, whatever? I can go on for hours. <laughs> I, can, I can listen to myself I talk for days. <laughs> 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 It's a tough crowd. It's a tough crowd, I tell you. That's why I wear a tie. I'm a professor. <laughs> you can take Isabel on your next brief. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so interactive scenario-based training. We talked about scenario-based training. What is scenario-based training? I, can, Considering what ifs of real situations. Can it be real situations? Yeah. Can it be artificial situations? Sure, absolutely. Can it be anything? It's plausibly real situations. Okay, plausible deniability. I'm a politician, so talk about it, okay? Put yourself in the scenario, put yourself in that situation and say, these are the circumstances, what would I do? Okay? Is there any one right answer to a scenario? No. No. The FAA is driving, wants people to do scenario-based training. They want you to do it so bad, the last time they updated their advisory circular was in 2005. <laughs> okay? The Part 141 schools are saying, we want a scenario where there's one outcome and one outcome only. Okay? Because it costs money to write scenarios where there are multiple outcomes. Okay? So that's what's driving this. Are there more than one possible right answer to a scenario? Yes. Yes. Okay? Yeah. And just because I do it this way, does that mean that you're going to do it that way, Stan? Does that mean that you're going to do it that way? No. Okay? Take your ability, and we'll talk about all that. Okay? So decision making, it's a systematic approach. It's a mental process. Okay? It's used by pilots to consistently determine the best course of action. Is it a perishable skill? Yes. Yes. Okay? As we get older, do our mental processes slow down? Yes. No. No, no of course not. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you see 62-year-old shortstops out there, right? <laughs> okay? So you based on the information that you have, you make good decisions. And again, you go through your Rolodex and say, Oh, this is the given set of circumstances. I've thought about that. I pulled the card out, now I have something to do. That's the whole point of scenario based training. Okay, you guys remember this accident? Mm, yeah. Yeah. What happened? I had an engine problem and head injuries. He uh, took a, uh, a Warbird airplane that was always showing signs of distress and kept flying formation with his uh, group until he finally got himself in a corner where the engine was uh, imminently failing. So he put it in the drink. Exactly. Okay? So the FAA officially listed this as a system component failure power plant. What happened 22 minutes prior to that? Overhead the field that they took off from. You've got fluid and smoke trailing from your engine. What should you as the pilot do when someone tells you you're overhead the field you took off from, you have fluid and smoke trailing from your engine? What is the most prudent course of action? <laughs> If he, that pilot, had gone back and landed, would we have known about this at all? No. no. But he got to be on CNN. <laughs> okay? So he was famous. So that's, when you look at the accidents, look back for causal factors. Okay? The FAA, the NTSB, they do a great job of pigeonholing these things in. But look for the, look for the decision process that the pilots were making. Okay? If, again, if that pilot, when they informed, that you've got fluid coming out, if they had, that pilot had gone and landed, you wouldn't know a darn thing about it, okay? And the aircraft would have been saved, and these people wouldn't have been dangerous, okay? So what's aviation safety all about? It's getting, you gotta get the cheese, right? So what is aviation safety all about? Preventing accidents. Preventing accidents, how do you do that? Mitigate risk. 
Mitigate risk, good, you've seen the slides. It's all about identifying risk and developing mitigation strategies. Being the second mouse. Being the way it can be the second mouse, that's, that is a mitigation strategy. Okay, but it's all about identifying risk. Do you do this sport because you are risk averse? No. I went up in the wave in a mini Nimbus to 28,000 feet. I went up in a unpressurized 700 pound piece of fiberglass wearing what I'm wearing with an oxygen mask. Is that a risky behavior? Yes. Did we have procedures to mitigate the risk? What's that? You didn't tell us yet whether you did. Yeah, we did. <laughs> you had training, you had procedures to mitigate the risk so you can do it safely. My position and our position in the SSF, you are not in this room because you're risk averse. You're in this room because you enjoy doing activities that most of the people out there consider really risky and you develop strategies, procedures, and techniques to mitigate those and do it safely. Okay, so that's what it's all about. So mental preparation, Arnold Palmer once said, he was hit a three iron or three wood and he rolled it onto the green. The person said, you got lucky. And he turned to him and said, well, the more I practice, the luckier I seem to get. Okay, but it's about doing the maneuvers in your head. Okay, practice the flight in your mind. As a student, did you actually sit down and chair fly the procedures? That's where, that goes to the condor question, too. That goes to the condor question. You know, when I was in the Navy, we used to put a Dixie cup down on the ground. That was the VOR, and I'd walk around with my little RMI card and say, what's it going to look like on the procedure as I go around? And then we'd stand across from each other, and we'd toss a ball back and forth to each other while we're reciting the procedures. You ever seen videos of either the Blues or the Thunderbirds? They sit down, they chair fly. Oh, yeah. Whole routines every time before they go out and do it. Yeah. They chair fly it, talk it through as a group. Yeah, you visualize what you're doing. Visualize yourself in that situation. If you visualize yourself, are you more likely to make a decision that's going to have a positive outcome? If you thought about it, okay? It's a 3-2 count. I know this pitcher loves to throw fastballs, and he loves to throw them low and away. So where am I looking for the pitch? Am I looking for a curveball up and in, or am I looking for that fastball down there? Okay, know the situation, know the tendencies, okay? All right. So where can you practice your scenarios? Pretty much everywhere. Pretty much everywhere, yeah. Can you practice it when you're driving? Sure. Can you practice it when you're doing the dishes? How about when you're folding laundry? Yeah. How about when you're in the aircraft? Yeah, you can practice them anywhere. Where's the best place to practice them? When you're not in flight. Well? And we're unless when you're in a situation or in a scenario. Okay, if I thought about that low altitude release situation as I'm driving because I thought about it when I was doing the dishes and folding the laundry, and I get out here with one of my instructors and we briefed it, am I going to be able to practice that scenario? Sure. Sure. The whole thing is that I thought about it. It's a whole mental approach to what you're doing. You're eventually going to want to practice it in the aircraft. Okay? And 90, or 6187 to 6131, depending upon how your training, requires you to do that low altitude brief or low altitude release. So you're going to have to do it anyway. So do the stuff that's going to get you ready for it. Okay? Are you going to have to make tough decisions in the glider? Yes. Yes. Definitely. Where and when do you make those tough decisions? Usually too late. What's that? Usually too late. Usually too late. Okay. <laughs> Say you're. Uh, wow. Who's that sitting in that A6 on the catapult in the Saratoga? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. When did I make the decision of should the catapult malfunction that I was going to pull the handle and give the airplane back to you, the taxpayers? Before it happens. Long time before that. What's that? Long time before. Yeah, long, long, long time before that. When I was sitting in a safe, comfortable environment, I was watching Walker, Texas Ranger. I had my cup of coffee, and I was thinking about it. That's when you make the decision. When do you, you know, you think about your low altitude release, what you're going to do. You think about when you're soaring on course, when I get down to what altitude, am I going to blow over the landing gear and land? Those are the things that you make in this safe, comfortable environment. And when you get the set of circumstances, A, B, C, and D, or whatever it is, is the decision made? Do I have anything to do? I'm going off the end, I'm 20 knots slow. I'm going swimming. 
okay? That's the thing that you have to make with those tough decisions. And that's something that you have to personally make for yourself. I can't tell you how to make it, your instructor can't tell you how to make it. If you're not comfortable turning, if you're not comfortable turning around at 300 feet, should you do it? No. If you're comfortable turning around at 400 feet, should you do it? Don't put yourself in a situation where you don't believe that your skills, your proficiency, and your aeronautical knowledge put you in a situation where you're introducing risk. Okay? All right, cool. So when you're doing scenario-based training, you have to have some kind of frame to put it into. So the FAA, the Soaring Safety Valve, evaluate the pilot, evaluate the aircraft, environment, get the V to fit, evaluate the environment, and evaluate the external pressures. Okay? And that's the PAVE model, okay? Who's the pilot? Okay, you're getting ready to launch. How many aircraft are involved in the launch? Two. Two, so how many pilots are involved? Two. How many aircraft are involved? How many environments are involved? Two. One. How many external pressures are involved? What's that? Many. Many. You got me, I want to launch because the soaring's really good. The co pilot's getting tired and he hasn't had his breakfast yet and he's got to go to the bathroom. And Stan over here says, Get that darn glider off the runway. You know, he's doing his best Joe Petroni. You know, get it up in the air, okay? So, what about external pressures? What are those? There's no external pressures here? Well, wait, didn't you I got west of the Rockies, so external pressures go away. Aren't those the ones you just went through, or was that environment? Yeah. Well, that could be envi well, uh, environment. I was thinking those were external pressures that you were talking about. Yes, yeah, those like are external pressures. So schedule, uh, having to get home. For having to get home. Drank too much water. Drank too much water, yeah. Is that an issue? That's internal. It becomes an internal pressure. <laughs> yeah. I can tell you by Mooney that uh, we have a two and a half hour range. Why? Well, after two and a half hours, my wife says, put this darn thing on the ground, okay? And when she's flying, we land at two hours, okay? But if the external pressure's like that, don't let them get in the way, all right? So decision-making against a systematic mental approach, it's something you have to practice. It's something you have to be proficient at. What kind of skills do you have? What are the two skills that you do when you're flying an aircraft? There's the monkey skills. You know, I'm sitting in the spinning chair and I'm flipping the switches, and there's the headwork skills, the mental skills. And they are both perishable, and they're both something you have to practice, and they're both something you need to be proficient. The food is here, so. Yeah, so call time. Call and, time. Uh, so 15 minutes, hit the head if you need to, get yourself something to eat, you back in your Okay. So, do you brief your emergencies before every flight? Yes. We do yeah. as practice. We do as practice, or do we do it as procedure? Procedure. What's that? There should be one answer. Yes, we brief emergencies every flight. Okay. Yes, no, maybe? Yes, yes we do. Okay. Now, I know I'm talking to you after you've had the food. The food coma is setting in. Okay, so we've got to overcome that. But you need to brief the contingencies before every flight. You need to plan on the failure happening. If I plan on it not happening, what am I going to do when it does happen? You're going to delay your action. I should be disappointed. It says I should be happy when it doesn't happen, happen but I'm not, you know, I'm not happy until you're not happy, so that's what we're working on here, okay? But you should be disappointed when you get to 1,000 feet and you didn't get to run through your procedures. Jeff, at UPS, do we brief a engine failure on every takeoff? Yes. Why do we do that? Just in case. Just in case, yeah. He's not a boy band singer, but it's what you do, okay? So be ready for that, all right? So, premature termination of the toe. What's the first thing you do after you've had your plan? That, what do I mean when I say the plan is appropriate for the conditions? <coughs> It means it's not going to be exactly necessarily. Sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, your plan's going to change based on the conditions, whether it's tailwind, headwind, crosswind. Tailwind, headwind, crosswind, what else? Different airports. Different airport, what else? Airport. How many stone planes do you guys have here? Two. Two. Are they both Pawnees? No. Okay. 
How many different gliders do you have? Do you have a 233? Yes. Is it going to be different in the 233 than it is going to be in the K21? If I've got a lot of wind down the runway and it's cold and I'm towing behind the Pawnee and I'm by myself in the 233, where am I going to be when I get down to about that point there? About two thirds of the way down the runway, how high am I going to be? What's that? <laughs> 10 feet, I heard. Behind the tow plane. You're going to be behind the tow plane, good. Where else am I going to be? Am I, where am I going to reach 200 feet? If I'm in a towing behind the Pawnee on a cold day with a lot of wind down the runway and a oh, Lake 233, it's going to be high. Yeah. I'm going to be really high. So is it going to be appropriate for me to turn around and come screaming back this way at 80 miles an hour? And touch down right about here on the two and roll into that uh, tow Zulu area? Okay, so make your plan appropriate for the conditions. If the wind is blowing 15 knots right down the runway, and I'm in the 233, do I maybe want to just land straight ahead? Up to about 400 feet, 500 feet? I don't know, that's for you guys to decide, okay? So review your plan prior to every flight, the airline pilots do it, and what's the first thing you have to do when you have a launch failure? Fly the glider. When you're in doubt of what to do, what should you do? Fly the glider. After you start flying the glider, what should you do? Keep flying, Keep flying the glider, okay? What we don't want to have happen, we had an accident a few years ago, a person was taking off in a 126, they were at about 150 feet, they heard a bang, they said, I don't know what to do, so I'm going to release. If you hear a bang and the tow plane is right there, oh, what's happening? The tow plane is still right there, do you need to release? Assess the situation, assess what's going on. Fly the glider, okay? So what specific actions do you do in each step? How many steps are there from the time that the tow plane starts to move until you get up to pattern altitude? I hear two. How many? Isabel, how many? Four. Four, Four. good. <laughs> okay? We highly recommend that you break it down into nauseating, and I mean nauseating detail of what you are going to do from the start of the takeoff roll until the tow plane is airborne. What is your procedure? You're rolling along, you get left up in the air, the tow plane's still on the runway, and all of a sudden the tow plane releases the rope. What are you going to do? What is the tow plane going to do? What are you going to do? Well, I've heard straight ahead, I've heard go right. What are you going to do? Away from the What are you planning for? Well, what is that? Go, go right. Okay, do you have a procedure? I highly recommend that you have a procedure for this so that you don't have to think about it. Because you got all that nice big space over there. Uh oh, the tow plane's starting to get big, a little bit of right rudder, roll up into the grass. Is it going to hurt the glider? Is it going to hurt you? No. Nope. Which way is the tow plane going to go? Should go left. Positive lateral separation. Okay, have a plan for that. What are you going to do with your left hand? Spoilers. What's that? Spoilers. Brakes. Spoilers out, start braking. This is the level of detail that I want you to get into. I'm rolling down the runway, everything's looking good. Oh, well, the tow plane's starting to get big. Okay, so bring the spoilers out, a little bit of right rudder, turn, roll off, come to a stop. Think about it in that level of detail. Think about it with that pacing. Okay? Am I going to go, oh crap, slam the right rudder, spoilers all the way out all at once? What's going to happen? <laughs> Ground loop you're probably going to ground loop it, you're going to blow a tire, whatever, but get the pacing in mind as well, okay? What about from the time that you lift off, the tow plane lifts off, to you get up to your turnaround altitude, whatever that is for the day? What are you going to do when the launch failure happens? Fly the plane. Fly the plane, okay, what else? <coughs> okay. I'm going this way. Can I end up in the overrun down there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Sure. Can I end up in the buildings over there? No. no. Okay. So when I say nauseating detail, the tow plane releases the rope or the tow plane just disappears out from under me. Okay. That's when you might want to release the rope, but get the stick forward. You might want to release the rope. 
assess your situation, either go straight ahead, turn, start setting up for the landing that's going to happen. Think about it in those terms. Think about it in that pacing. Okay? That's scenario-based training. What am I going to do? How am I going to do it? What am I going to do if the wind is from the right there? Turn to the right. You can turn to the right, sure. Is that crosswind going to affect which way I'm going? <coughs> what about the wind is from the left? Ooh, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're in Portland. It's weird, right? Okay. What are you going to do if the wind is from the left? Are there any orographic turbulence that might be if the wind is from the left there? Is that going to affect what you do? There's also from the right. Okay, got it from the right too. But think through the scenarios. What am I going to do? How am I going to do it? Okay, so that when it happens, it's not a surprise. Should you thought about it? Okay, what about up to your abbreviated pattern altitude? What's an abbreviated pattern altitude? 200? Lighter dependent. Lighter dependent. Wind dependent. Wind dependent. What else dependent? Pilot dependent. How is it pilot dependent? Experience. Experience. What else? Placement, where you are. Where you are. But what else about the pilot? I have experience and I have? Practice. I've flown 15,000 hours in UPS airplanes. I haven't flown one in two years. So am I experienced? Yes. Am I proficient? No. no. OK. So take both of those into account Okay. what you're going to do. But the abbreviated pattern altitude, say you get to 500 feet, can you fly a downwind base and final? No. How long is your runway? 3,000 feet. Do I have to land in the touchdown zone area in the first 1,000 feet? No. Can I land in the last third? Yes. Okay. How about the middle third? How about the overrun? Okay. Those are the things you need to think about because, again, like we talked about in the accidents, abbreviated pattern does not mean that I'm going to fly around the pattern low. It means that I'm going to fly a good pattern and I'm going to end up the other end of the runway. You're going to have to send the golf cart and you're going to tell me that back down. Okay? But that's a way of thinking about how you're going to get around. And then, what altitude do you have a normal pattern possible? In terms of low break up. Yeah, you, well, for whatever reason, the tow plane has decided you're not going to go any higher than 700 feet. Can you fly a normal pattern? No. Okay, what are some of the things you have to think about? Wind. Wind. What else? Where are you? Where are you? Right are you flying? Yep. Okay. Other traffic. Other traffic. Are you going to make a radio call? As your last priority. What's that? As your last priority. That's your last priority, because what's the first priority? Fly. Let's hear that again. Fly. Fly the aircraft, okay? So are you going to do a checklist? Is checklist part of Aviate Navigator Communicate? Yeah. It comes just after Aviate before Navigate. It's part of the Aviate. So you want to get the checklist to make sure the glider is properly configured. Okay, is the trim going to be pretty close to where you want it for the pattern? Probably for the tow. That means the airspeed is going to take care of itself. You just got to find the uh, whirl handle. Are you going to be in a high state of tension and readiness when this happens? Tension, yes. Hopefully. Okay, you know, you're going to be worked up. You're going to be going, oh my God, I just had that launch failure. That's when you have to slow down, take a breath. Now it's 12.33 and the 26th. Figure out where you are, do your checklist, evaluate the, the aircraft. Slow things down, pace, and like somebody said, think about what you're doing, okay? Does that all make sense? You can practice each one of these scenarios as you're driving home tonight. So what am I gonna do when I'm at 250 feet and the tow plane has just started a left turn off the end of the runway? What am I gonna do? You can walk through the procedures. You can do that over and over and over again. From the time it takes me to drive from here to Portland Airport, how many times can I run over this procedure? A lot. Do you think that the more you think about it, the better your outcome is going to be? Or the better possibility you're going to have of a positive outcome? That's the whole point of scenario-based training. 
Okay? So if the launch failure happens, fly the glider. I can't emphasize this enough. Fly the glider. All those PT3 axes, the one and five, the thing that they did not do was fly the glider. Okay? Establish a pitch attitude for your pre-brief airspeed. Why do I say best over D plus five knots is a good place to start? Which? Okay. Is there guidance from the FAA on what speed you should be flying the approach at? We're my instructors. Yes. Talk to me. Plus. Speak to me. <clears throat> Is there guidance? VSO. What's that? 1.3 VSO. Wrong. <laughs> I crash. There is guidance for glider flying handbook, and it differs from what the Soaring Safety Foundation advises. No. <laughs> I can show you. Okay. What we advise and what the glider flying handbook says is 1.5 VSO. What number is really, really close in every glider you're going to fly to 1.5 VSO? Best L over D. Do I know what do I know what VSO is? No. Do I use v, best L over D almost every flight? Yeah. So why do I want to be five knots faster than best L over D? The way we kids. Well, yeah. Okay. My kids are in college. Well, they're out of college. They're married. Okay. So why do I want to be faster? Wind shear. Wind shear. What was that concept we talked about before? When you're coming down through the wind gradient. Wind gradient. If I am flying faster than best over D and I come down through a two knot wind gradient, is my glider performance increasing or decreasing? Increasing. Have I done anything to increase my glider's performance? No. I'm using the physics of what's going on out there to my advantage. We highly recommend, and I mean highly recommend, that you pick speeds, you pick procedures that are based upon sound technical reasons. That's why we say best of D plus five. Okay? And we recommend a 45 degree angle of bank. Why a 45 degree angle of bank? You lose the less altitude 45 degrees. I lose the less altitude? Is that the only reason? So less likely to stall it. You'll get around quick. You're also likely to be used to seeing that. Okay. It's, yeah, it's a trade-off of uh, efficiency yeah. getting turned around. And What's that, Stan? Talk to me. It's a trade-off because everything is a trade-off. You want to get turned around as efficiently as possible without pushing yourself into a higher risk uh, uh, stall loading. Okay, so I want to minimize the radius of turn. I want to maximize the rate of turn. And I want to minimize the loss of altitude associated with that. And that magically happens at 45 degrees angle bank. So if somebody mentioned 1.3 VSO, VSO, well, that's 44 <coughs> knots in your K21. If I'm flying best over D, which is 52 knots plus 5, 57, now I'm 13 knots over stall, as opposed to being 2 knots over stall. Whoa. I'm not that good of a pilot to fly 2 knots over. I can fly 13 knots <laughs> fast. Okay? So execute your pre-proof plan. Take a second or two to orient yourself and calmly execute the plan. <coughs> when is the emergency over? Well, think about it. The emergency is that I'm being forced to fly the glider. I've got the stick over, I've got the airspeed, the attitude established to get the speed I want. I roll into that 45 degree angle of bank. I look out there. The runway is magically out there. How it happened, I don't know. Is that an emergency situation anymore? Yes. It shouldn't be. What's that? It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. Now it's a downwind landing. Okay? Do you practice downwind landings? No. No. It sounded like you did at the beginning. You were talking about landing with seven knot tailwinds and such. Okay? But the emergency is over. Fly the glider. Do it calmly. Okay? Smoothly fly the aircraft. Maintain your target airspeed. Keep the turn coordinated. Why do you want to keep the turn coordinated? Always gonna keep turns long. You always want to wear gliders, right? <laughs> if I don't have yaw, I can't what? Spin. Spin. And then do not rush. Okay? So how do you guys do it here when you take off? Do you maintain runway heading or do you maintain runway center line? We maintain central. Uh, what's that? Do we maintain runway center line here or do we maintain runway heading? Okay, so how do you plan to do it? Are you gonna offset? And turn around, or you can do the limbs and turn and come back around. What's that? You're going to do the immediate return? Immediate return, yeah. Okay. Turning to the What's that? That looks like a button. That's where a lot of people lose it. 
Yeah, a lot of people lose it around here because they go, oh my gosh, I'm overshooting, so they wrap it up. Okay. Yeah. What makes the wing? What makes the glider turn? The horizontal component of lift. Right. Okay. They taught us in the Navy the lift vector comes straight out the top of my head. If I want to go to you, I move the lift vector over that way. What does the rudder do? Controls yaw. It's what? Controls yaw. Yeah. What else does it do? It keeps the yaw string straight. Yes, sir. It prevents adverse yaw. Well, what is what is adverse yaw? Barn door effect. Adverse yaw is when you're rolling the aircraft because you're making differential lift. So you have the adverse yaw. Okay? The primary purpose of the rudder, which the Wright brothers found out, was to coordinate the turn. Okay? So that's the point there. Keep it, keep it coordinated all the way around. And at 200 feet, if you do it right, you'll have plenty of altitude. I'm not that brave. I practice most of my rope breaks at 250, 300. And I find that works for me. Okay? Why are we turning to the right in all these situations? What's that? The wind is from the right. So how does that make a difference? So remember the 45 degree angle of bank, minimize the radius of turn and maximize the rate. If I turn downwind, what am I doing to my radius of turn? If I turn into it, what am I doing? I'm minimizing the radius of turn. So I want to do a pirouette out here and turn around if I can. So I use the wind to my advantage. Again, a technical reason for why you do something. Okay, not just because hey, that guy from Pensacola got up there and told me to do it. You know, have a real technical reason for why you do it. Okay, so your airspeed indicator. When was the last time you took a look at this and really thought about what these markings are? Okay, so again, <coughs> let's start up here. What's this red thing? Not to exceed. What does that mean? Your wings come off. <laughs> No. It's a speed not to exceed. Is that a limit or is that a goal? <laughs> okay, so what is it? Okay, what about this yellow arc? What's that? Caution range. I heard somebody say caution. What is it? Caution range. The caution operating range. Yeah. What's the green arc? What's that? Normal operating range. Normal operating range. Excellent. What is this god awful thing, this yellow triangle? Best flight slope. Yes. What's that? Best flight slope. Nope. It's the fastest, uh, slowest speed that you can fly with your full spoilers out. It is a European certification requirement. It is the minimum recommended approach speed. Uh -huh. 1.4 VS1, which in your K21 is 49 knots. What does it mean by minimum? Should that be your target speed? That should be the minimum. Again, the glider flying handbook, and it, we'll talk about that, you'll educate me, 1.5 VSO plus five knots, which if you do all that, puts you up at 56 knots, which is not down here at 49. What happens when you come down through the wind gradient and you're flying at the yellow triangle? <coughs> it drops below. It Does your performance increase or decrease? Decreases. Decreases. Okay, it's gonna take you more altitude to recover your speed and get back in control. So that's why, if it was up to me, which it's not, I'd get rid of that damn thing. <laughs> Too many pilots go, that's my approach speed. I'm like, no, it's a minimum recommended approach speed. Okay, and again, we talk about 1.5 VSO, fly the air best over D. Uh, is the maneuvering speed shown on this? No. No? It's in the green. What's that? It's in the green. Green, yellow. Is it here? That's the edge of it. But every piece is different based on the gross weight of the aircraft, so you can't put it on the side. Ah, the maneuvering speed is the speed at which you will stall the wing before you overstress the wing. With a single axis input there? Uh, it's like probably you're right, yes. Like you Dang, you guys ask good questions, okay? <laughs> so it, as your weight goes down, what happens to your maneuvering speed? Goes down. Goes down. Goes down. down. I hear up, down, we're flying around, looping the loop and defining the ground. What are we doing? Oh. If my wing can make X amount of force and I don't weigh as much, am I going to get the four times what I weigh sooner or later? 
sooner. So as your weight decreases, your maneuvering speed goes down. And then you take it in the Navy and the Air Force, you get into rolling pulls. When you're rolling the aircraft and pulling, now you got one wing going up, the other wing comes down, the wing that's rising is more loaded up than the other wing. So you can overstress the airplane doing a rolling, pulling maneuver well below the maneuvering speed. Okay? Cool. Any questions on the airspeed indicators? Yes, no, maybe? Okay. All right. So we're talking about every, getting everyone involved when you're briefing a PT3 event. Highly recommend that the first PT3 with the learners be briefed. And I mean get everybody involved. Get stands people involved, get the tow pilots, get the instructor, get the learner, get everybody. It shouldn't be a surprise. Then after that, Isabel's fair game. Okay? <laughs> so, and again, you got good Navy pilots doing their thing here. Okay? So, does this look familiar? What are you going to do? Uh, just go around and say, I have the PT3 right here, right under the A in the Ken Jurin State Airfield. What am I going to do? Am I going to go straight ahead into the trees? Am I going to turn and go into the I'm horn? Sorry, you take off seven or two five. Uh, take it off this way. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, let's go the way you normally go. Sorry, sorry. I'm going to have, I thought you meant right at the start of the roll. I'm going to get at the A and Hood yeah. Tech arrow there. I have gotcha. a launch failure. What am I going to do? Okay, tell me. Wait, Shay, you're at 150 feet. What are you going to do? Straight ahead. Okay. You're going to land straight ahead. You're going to roll across here, across this road. Yeah. Are you going to turn it? I mean, what's that? I hear all sorts of different things. What are you going to do? What's that? Burger shop on the uh, on the other side of the road. Is it right here? Yeah, that's the yeah, that's the burger shop. Okay. I want grilled onions and cheese on it. Exactly. Tell them as they're going over. Okay. So what are your options? Go onto the Google Earths here and say, what happens if I got What are my options? Which way can I go? What can I do? Land over there by the museum in that green spot. What, this over here? Uh -huh. You're going to do a 90 degree turn and come over the parking lot with all the nice light stanchions? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. I have a hand up in the back. You mean up over here? Yeah. So I'm at 150 feet. How far can I go? K21, 30 to 1, nominally called 24 to 1, 150 feet up. I can go 3,000 feet. I can go one runway length off the end here, can I? Yeah. You just straight ahead. You had to ground a little bit before you hit the road. You ground a little bit before you hit the road. Okay. All right. So which? What's that? Then 150 feet, you're not going to get down. If you go full spoilers at 60 knots in a K21, how fast are you coming down? 1,200 feet a minute? But you're already in the road. 1,200 feet a minute? That's seven seconds to get down from 150 feet a minute. I'm doing 60 knots. That's 100 feet a second. So I'm going to go 700 feet to tra travel down. I'm probably right about here when I touch the ground. I'm going to roll on across the street into the hamburger joint. Okay. Again, break it down into technical terms like that. How fast am I coming down? How fast am I going to translate across the ground? How far am I going to translate across the ground? Then what am I going to do when I actually put the wheel on the dirt? That's the level you need to break it down. When you're taking off to the west, you guys turn out left or right? Right. Okay, so you get over here. Right over here, you're about 300 feet. What are you going to do? Are you going to come back in and land this way? Yes. Yeah. Are you going to do a pattern and come this way? It depends on the winds. What else? Traffic. Do you care about the traffic? Yeah, right. Okay. Can you land on the taxiway? Yes. Can you land on the grass? Okay. Again, this is the level that I really encourage you to do. Say you get over here and you're at 500 feet. What are you going to do? Here, I'm almost got too much. Got to bring some off. But what are you going to do? Are you going to turn around and do a downwind? You're going to enter a right base. What are you going to do? Right base. Sorry, sorry, right base. Okay, where's your aim point going to be? 
Depends on the angles we're starting out. Yeah, right. Okay, you gotta aim to put it down the numbers. You can aim to put it down right here so you can get quick access to the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Again, that's the level that I really highly encourage you to get into. Say, I have a rope break here at 500 feet. What am I going to do? In your K21 at 500 feet here, where will I intercept the normal glide path to the runway? I'm asking. You guys have the K21. You're the ones that fly here. I know my answer where I would intercept. Well, you'll be I know my answer where I would intercept the glide path. But where will you intercept it? You'd be below it at that point, so you'd want to keep it in close. Okay. But you wouldn't want to do a normal base way out, right? So again, you're in a K21. You got the spoilers close. You're doing 60 knots. You're getting about 30 to 1. Normally in the pattern with the spoilers deployed, how fast are you coming down? Right, that's full spoil. You're coming oh, down yeah, about okay. 500 feet a minute, right? Somewhere in that neighborhood, four or 500 feet a minute. You're doing 60 knots. What's your L over D at that point? I'm doing uh, 60 15. knots, coming down at four knots. So my best, my L over D 15. is 15. 15 is twice as good as 30. Do you think I can intercept the glide path that I want to be on at some point? Sure. Sure. And that's the whole point. If I go to 500 feet down, what's my L over D? 60 feet forward, 500 feet down. 60 divided by 5 is? 12. 12. Okay, if I'm coming down at 600 feet a minute, what's my best L over D? What's my L over D at 60 knots? 10, yeah. You have to do higher math here, okay? Okay, any Marines? I saw there was an Army guy here somewhere, so that's okay. But that's the kind of technical detail you need to think about this in. Say, what's what is actually physically happening with the glider, okay? And then once you intercept the glide path, is it an emergency anymore? No, it's a, just a regular old landing. And that's the way you want to look at it, okay? And that's scenario-based training for the landing pattern, okay? Any questions on that? Or not the landing pattern, the PT3s. Questions, comments? The food comments I didn't serve. It feels like what you're uh, essentially pointing out here is that the Hood River Airport, there are parts of the envelope, the takeoff envelope, where there are very limited options. There may only be one good answer, and you better know what that answer is, and you better have studied that in advance, rather than leaving it to sort of a general discussion. And there may be parts of the envelope where there are no answers, that we have black zones, and that may just be something we have to accept about this airport, and if so, we should be honest about it. What do you guys think of that? It's true. It's an example of why we don't do uh, commercial and student training off of seven. Okay. So yes, highly recommend you do that. And should you do that? Thing? I did this in Pensacola, but I got a real nice picture of your operation. You can go to Minden. You can get a picture. You can go to, you know, Cordell. You can go to Seminole Lake. You can get all that on this nice Google Earth thing here, and you can analyze it before you get there. You're sitting on the plane going down there. You know, you could be playing solitaire on the back of your seat, or you could be analyzing what you're going to do. Okay? What type of plane? What's that? What type of plane? I don't know, some airliner, some tube that I'm sitting in the back of. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can sleep in the front, I can't sleep in the back. <laughs> My wife hates that, by the way. <laughs> so, okay? So, en route decision making. What's that? Dozing for dollars. Dozing for dollars, yes. You can ask Jeff, you know, do we ever sleep in the cockpit? No. No, no. that's illegal. <laughs> and that's wrong. Okay? So en route decision making. What's the biggest decision you have to make when you're going cross country en route? Where is home? Well, I know where home is, it's where I left it. So No, not necessarily. Okay. At some point you give up if you're going cross country. Ah. You give so up where your home is. So you make the decision to <coughs> establish a new home. Establish new home. Yes, you make the decision to land out. Excellent. Okay? So that is personal to you. You have to decide when you're going to stop soaring and when you're going to go land. Is that something you do in the aircraft or is that something you do when you're watching Murder She Wrote with a cup of coffee? Do you guys know what Murder She Wrote is? <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, Beverly Hills 90210. Oh, you're really playing with a 60 year old. Okay. 
That is something you do in that comfort zone like I showed before. If you make that decision, then when I get down to X altitude, I'm done soaring, I'm landing. Okay? We used to call it the hard deck. We got lots of pushback, so we changed its name to the minimum end route soaring altitude. And they're nicely depicted on charts. <laughs> okay? It's the low altitude, the lowest altitude you'll be able to recognize and recover from a low altitude and inadvertent stall. Again, you inadvertently stall. What's the first thing you say? You say one of your golf words. You just missed that three-foot putt. What the heck's going on? Now you have to recover. Do you have? Does the glider care how high you are? No. Is when you're out in your K21 and you stall it and it starts to spin on you, does it care how high you are? Is it going to take X number of feet to recover regardless? Yes. Yep. And if you're below that altitude, I don't care how good a pilot you are, you will not recover. The physics are against you, okay? And you still have to have the time and the energy to configure the aircraft, fly some sort of pattern, and land. I've actually had people who think themselves really good in this sport say, I practiced this from 500 feet. That's dumb. That is just dumb, okay? Establish it for yourself. Any you know who Dr. Deming is? Yes. Yes. He said you have to collect data to make a good decision. Okay, so collect data on yourself. Analyze your experience, analyze your proficiency. They're two different things. Okay? If I haven't flown in six months and Isabella has just gotten ready to solo, who's more proficient? Isabella. Isabella, yeah. So analyze your aircraft. Is doing it in my duo discus, is that different than doing it in the Ventus? Yeah. Is it doing it different than the, the 126? Heck yeah. The conditions? And my expectations. How do your expectations play into this? So that go to your, to your decision making. It goes to your decision, decision making. making yeah. The amount of time it takes. We've got we've got tickets to Riverdance tonight, so I got to be home. <coughs> okay. Those are the expectations. But bring all those together and make something for yourself. Okay. So make the decision to land out. Make the decision early. Why do you want to make the decision early? More options. More options. If I have one option, how many options do I have? <laughs> None. Because I either do that or I don't. Okay, so give yourself lots of options. Pick a good field, buy a good approach, and we'll talk about low saves. I, can I note that the uh, Yost thing was way the hell off there? Oh, very good. Thank you. <laughs> that scared me. Okay. This, this low. So. Ah. This is called implicit training. This person, they must be doing it right because they're doing everything well. They're coming down a thousand feet a minute. The yaw string is way off to the side, and their airspeed is slow. Okay. This, yeah, I don't know what happened in the red. This came, actually came out of a video. The person turned around and landed on a field going that way. But yeah, that's implicit training. You really don't want to be showing this to your students. Why am I showing this? I don't know. It's pretty. Okay. So make the decision. Pick a good field. Fly a good approach. Ken Sorensen, at one of the FERCs about six years ago, came up with what we're calling the Sorensen Doctrine. If you're going cross country, if you're above 3,000 feet, you're booming on course. You're down below 3,000, you're still booming on course, but you're starting to look for places to land. You get down below 2,000 feet, now you've got a place picked out to land, but you're still trying to find lift. You get down to your mesa, you're in the landing pattern because you made the decision back in your living room with your cup of coffee. There's no decision to be made, okay? You get, Steve's gonna be upset, we gotta go pull the K21 out of a field. Is he going to be happy? Who cares? It doesn't matter. Okay? He's made a safe decision. Okay? And that's what your office, the leadership, and everyone, if someone makes a safe decision, say, I couldn't find a lift, I got down to my mesa, and I landed. What should you tell them? Good job. Good job. Excellent. Good decision making, good skills. Now we get to do training because you have to do training on assembling and disassembling a glider. So it's a training opportunity. Okay? So that's the Sorensen Doctrine, okay? So what's the best place to land out? The airport. <laughs> Isabel. Another airport. Thank you, good. Okay, not a cultivated field. Hay fields are good except for what? Hay bales. Hay bales, yeah. Okay, down near where I am, we have cotton bales. So cotton fields are real good, but we got cotton bales. Fields of short crops are good, and cut fields after a harvest. Okay, those are good fields to land in. Can you go back a few slides to the Hood River? Um, 
Well, something to think about when you're briefing another airfield is all these nice green looking fields here. No, 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 no. no, no. Around the river, these are no, all no. orchards. <laughs> no, no, no. So keep in mind when you're cult the cultivated, short cultivated. Okay, yes, good. See, that's where you can use that, okay? So, what are bad places to land at? Orchards. <laughs> Orchards, yes, good. Vineyards. Why don't you want to land in pastures? <laughs> what do cows do when they come up to a glider? Eat it. <laughs> they eat it. One wing is on the ground, so what's that? A ram. That's a ramp. What do cows do when they see ramps? They walk oh. up them. Okay? What do horses do when they see something they don't like where they live? <laughs> they kick it. Okay, so don't highly recommend you don't use livestock. Uh, fields with high crops, orchards, you don't want to do that. Why don't you want to land on roads? Wires. 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 What else? Cars. Banks. Cars. 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 People. People. Uh, rough ground. Rough ground. Man, what else? Boxes. Wires, posts, so, stop signs, cars, and more. Dang, you're good. You're going to go far. Okay. So how wide is your 15-meter glider? <laughs> okay, we're in America. We do things in English numbers, okay? How wide is your 15-meter glider? 50 feet. 50 feet. How wide is Interstate 210 out there, whatever it is? 83. 30-some feet. Is your glider going to fit? No. Okay, that's why you don't want to do it. Why don't you land on playing fields and golf courses? People, what else? Uh, What's that? Hills. They have hills on them, yes. What else? Like traps. Sand traps. Sand traps. <laughs> you know, yeah. Tiger Woods yeah. is not a good golfer. I can play good golf from the fairways. He's never had to play the stuff I've got to play out of. Okay. Other the golf yeah, balls? <coughs> yeah. What's normally around a playing field? Fences. Poles. Poles with lights on them, right? How high are they up in the air? Too high. Oh, very very high, okay? That's why they're not a good idea. Golf courses, what do golf courses normally have around the fairway? Trees. Trees, yes. Okay, that's why we don't want to do it. And why don't you want to land in fields that are irrigated? Like water. Like Depends on what irrigation. Okay. The pipes. Talk about the circles? The crop circles, sure. How is that different than a, a what do they call it, flooding irrigation? Oh. The huh. irrigation system with the pipes. Okay, it's got pipes, they're bad. Muddy. Wet ground is what? Muddy. Oh. Okay, you want to make an arrestment in your glider? I can tell you from personal experience that you land in a muddy field, you're going to roll about from here to the end of that table. Okay, and where all, where's all the mud go? Up in the wheel well. And you still have to get the glider a quarter mile across a muddy field. Okay, so just be very careful of that. If it's your only option, if it's your best option, go there, but know that that's what you're going to have to deal with. Okay. How are you going to fly your pattern? Six legged. What's fly that? a box around the field. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. You're going to fly a box around the field. You're going to touch down. Why are you aiming for the middle of the field? You'd rather not be short. You'd rather not be short. What else? Unseen wires. Wires. Where do the wires normally hang out? Around the edge. Around the edge. Around the trees. Okay. Yeah, and you don't want to be too low over the trees either. Exactly, yeah. Because what happens when you're coming in and you go below the tree line? Wind shear. Wind shear, yep, that wind grain that we talked about. Okay, the access to the road is right here. So where do I want to land? Near the road. Do I want to land near the road? Is that a consideration? Yeah, not for safety. Okay, this is very sexist, WWSS. Wild weasels simmer slowly or something like that. But wires, wind, slope, and surface. And identify those. So if I've got wires here and I'm going up the hill into the wind, is that good? Up the hill is good. Yeah, up the hill into the wind. yeah, if I'm going up the hill into the wind, is that the best situation? Yeah. 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 But what about if the furrows are going across? Do I want to land with the furrows, across the furrows? <coughs> with them. Okay, with them, yeah. So that's things to identify. And then, if everything's in your favor, and the access point is here, yeah, you can land and roll up close to it, but the access to getting the glider out of the field should be the last priority. Yeah. Unfortunately, what we see in a lot of accidents is it's the number one priority. Okay, so we don't want to do that. All right, does that all make sense? And so why do you fly a six-leg pattern? 
because you uh, remember for the bronze badge it trains you, you want to be able to look at the field from different angles, and then you can pick out with the different shadows, you can then pick out different surface features that you wouldn't otherwise see in a first look. Okay. And when should you be planning your pattern? Short term memory. Oh. Uh, you, What's that? <laughs> Some of us drink coffee in the glider, but no, when you're, again, when we talked about uh, the Sorensen Doctrine, when you're down below 2,000 feet, you found that field, now you're getting yourself set up for it, okay? okay? Ken doesn't like that we do that, but that's okay. Okay? So then apply the pattern, go in and land, all right? So what about low-altitude saves? What is a low-altitude save? Finding lift low. Okay, finding lift low. Below what altitude? You're Mesa. I've made the decision to go in and land. Now I've turned base and I hit a booming thermal. What do I do? I land. Remember the checklist thing? I've done the landing checklist. I've moved into the soaring phase. I've now moved into the landing phase. Okay? What are you going to do if someone starts to tell you about their great low altitude save? Save it. Shake your head more. You're going to, it's like when your cat is smoking in the house. You're going to spray it with water and you're going to firmly tell it no. Okay? Someone starts to tell you about a low altitude save, you're going to go, I don't want to hear about that. Get that crap out of here. You almost killed yourself. You almost broke the glider and you almost raised my insurance rates. Okay? I don't want to hear about it. Okay? And that's the thing you have to think about with that. So, okay? Make talking about low altitude saves as socially unacceptable as me pulling out a camel here, a filterless camel and lighting up in this room here. Okay? What would you do if I did that? Spray with water. Spray with water for me telling me no. Good. Okay? But make it socially unacceptable. Okay? And unfortunately, we've had some difficulty with some of the people who do social media about you know displaying stories of law to saves people doing low finishes things like that uh, you know at some point you know that's what the really experienced people do they do so when do you become really experienced enough to be able to do a law to save if you survive long enough if you survive long enough okay again all the physics are against you everything is against you you're low you're tired you're hot you're thirsty you're hungry it's all against you okay so this is why one of the things we talk about here, and I'll ask this from Steve. Uh, somebody you see out there, they're thermaling in the pattern at 400 feet, and they climb up and away, and they land, and they talk about what a great thing it was. What does your club do? You spray water on from me, tell you no. That's good. We've gotten that. So you see, but what do you do? Who do you who do you talk with? What do you tell Steve or Thomas? Excuse me. You know what picture this is from, right? Yes, Thomas, Thomas Crown McCare. Thomas, Thomas Crown McCare, yeah. Have you guys seen Thomas Crown McCare? Yeah. The Steve McQueen one, yeah. The Steve McQueen one, yeah. Okay. But what do you tell Thomas? <coughs> you know, do you counsel them in private? Do you counsel them publicly? Do you berate them in private? Do you berate them publicly? What do you do? What's that? I just spray them with water. Yes, they do spray them with water, and they don't like that. So, But we highly recommend that the leadership say, Hey, Thomas, we saw that you were thermaling down low and pattern out there. We don't do that here. This is your notice. If I see you do it again, you're not going to get a tow here again. And in this scenario, you follow up with the student also who was affected by that. You follow up with the student who was affected. Okay? Again, the students are very, excuse me, the learners are very impressionable. If they see, this is what experienced pilots do. Well, when I get experienced, I can do it. Well, no. Okay? Create that situation where nothing like that's happening. Okay? Does that all make sense? And that's another scenario that you can do on a club level, how you're going to deal with somebody like that. Okay? You see, and you know, you can change it around to excuse me. To somebody who you're normally supposed to come this way, right? So you see somebody who's over here and they're third one over here and they go, oh, okay. And you see them do it once and they go, yeah, I got low. Then you see him do it again, and again, what are you going to do? You can build scenarios as a club of how you're going to do things. Okay? So, okay, so we're almost done. You can applaud. We're just a little bit after one. Okay, we haven't left one up there yet. So landing, how can you do a landing scenario? 
What speed are you going to fly in the landing pattern? Depends on the wind. Depends on the wind. So what is your formula for the landing? I over the Oh, one half wind speed. One half the max 1.5 PSO plus five knots. Okay, that's a start. What if you've got ten knots? What if you got 15, ten knots of wind gusting to fifteen? What are you going to? What's your additive going to be? Seven. Seven point five plus five. Five knots plus the gust factor, so ten knots. I'm going to be flying at sixty-one knots. Okay, keep it simple. But have a table, have a, a training of what you're actually going to fly. You use the whole. Uh, Gust factor? Uh, yes, half the steady state wind plus the gust. The gust factor, which is the difference between the gust and the between steady state. Between the steady state and the gust, yes. Okay. Does it get gusty winds around here? Okay. Yeah. And the whole idea of that is that if you're flying through the gust and all of a sudden the gust goes away, you know, what are you going to do? Okay. So sorry about the flicking back and forth. So this is out of the advisory circle, the pattern that you're going to fly. It looks remarkably similar to the pattern that you guys recommend. Okay? Do you fly a downwind base and final? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. What do your traces say you do, Steve? It depends. It depends. That's <laughs> right. Okay? Right. The trace shows that you do a nice sweeping curve and you start your turn and you just make yeah. one continuous turn. Yeah. You do a navy Carrier approach or a Spitfire curved approach? <laughs> okay? So, but get in and analyze. What's happening to your ground speed on downwind? Increase speed of the wind. Increasing. Okay? What are you going to do with your spoilers? More spoiler, less spoiler? Probably more. Are you going to make this turn earlier or later? Earlier. 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 Okay, now what's it going to do on your base leg that's actually a turn? You're going to need to crab. Which way are you going to crab? Into, into the, the wind. Okay, into the wind. Okay, so this is a more than 90 degree turn, right? Is that going to take more time at altitude or less time at altitude? More time while you're being pushed down wind. So. While you're being pushed down wind, okay? Yeah. And when you make the turn to final, is that going to be a 90 degree turn? No, the scenario is a little less. less. A little less. Then what's going to happen to your, air, your ground speed on final? Slow down. He's going to slow. What are you going to need for your spoilers? Okay, so you're going to need less spoiler to maintain the desired glide path. Can you fly a steeper approach? Is that a way to mitigate the wind? If I fly a normal approach into a pretty good headwind, what kind of options do I have? If the wind drops out, speed or Altitude, you're low. Okay, at the Navy, in the Navy, because everything's Navy centric, <laughs> when we had a lot of wind and the ship, you know, when we had 35 plus knots of wind, we flew a steeper glide path angle. Steep approach in high wind is a safer approach because it gives you more options. If I get low, I've got a lot more spoiler to take out to go forward. If I get high, I've got the wind at my advantage and I can come down. Okay? But that's the level, again, the level of detail we want you to break it down into. What about if the wind is from the southwest here? What's it going to do to your base leg? Shorten it. Shorten it. You're gonna speed. It's going to speed you up a little bit. It's going to shorten it. I heard it's going to speed up. So how does that <coughs> sped up base leg, how does that change what you're doing? Make sure you don't overshoot. Ah, yeah, really the dreaded overshooting crosswind. <laughs> so right. how are you going to mitigate that? Turn, turn, early. Early. turn early. I can turn early. What else can I do? Bank steeper. Bank steeper. What else? Can I move my downwind out? Yeah. yeah. Sure. They're all acceptable. We had one scenario. Now we've got one, two, three different options. Which one is best? It depends. Somebody asks me when I'm flying, do I wear boxers and briefs? I say, I don't know. Depends. <laughs> <laughs> I got the same reaction. It's the same reaction. Okay. But yeah, break it down like that because now you have different options. Okay? Have you ever had a time where at 1,000 feet, the wind is on your tail, but when you get down to 500 feet, and it's now on your tail again? Yeah, it can happen. 
So be prepared for that, but you have options for what you're going to do as you go around, okay? So how do you apply your patterns? Right hand. Right. Okay, right handed, so you come this way so and you come this stuff. way. Right. Why do you do that? So that way it's a hard power to hard Okay, the power traffic always flies left hand? Yeah. What does the advisory circular from the FAA say? It's 90-66B. What does that say about traffic patterns? What's yeah. that? Are you're asking about the A circular? The advisory circular. Yeah, for traffic it says that we should be flying inside the uh, power of traffic, we put the speed on Yep, that's what the advisory circular says. And again, advisory circle is not regulatory in nature; it's advisory in nature. If you guys have a procedure to fly opposite, then that's great. If everybody knows that that's what the procedure is, it's published for you. Okay. So. Okay. What's that? I said it's published in the supplement. Okay. Yeah. So the information is out there. Yeah, it is. Okay. Yes. Okay. What does the advisor circular about radio usage say? Any idea? Where is it? What does it say you should announce? Downwind. Downwind. Forty-five. Downwind. Base. Final. Clearing. Okay. Do you have time as a glider pilot to make all those radio calls? Usually. Yeah. Depends. <laughs> Depends. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. A lot of noise. Yep. Okay. But it adds a lot of chatter to the radio. Okay. So, what are your considerations as you're flying? Are there any? How do you do it? I will listen for uh, other power planes. Sometimes, okay. sometimes when you call on the radio and uh, if you're far enough out to where you have plenty of altitude and there's, you know. And, and you make a call, you know there's a power plane in the area, and you make a call, sometimes it freaks them out, you know, and, uh, <laughs> you know right? Because you're a glider, and they, oh my God, there's a glider in the, in the, in the pattern, you know? And so sometimes if you listen and just uh, make uh, some choices depending on what the traffic's going on, and if the power plane is close in and he's ready to land, it's probably best not to, you know, let him know that you're coming in for a landing as it can cause Problem. Okay. If you're ahead of hand. Okay. Ahead so Dr. Spawn is out here in his Mooney, <laughs> and you're right here turning base. What are you going to do? Extend. You're going to extend if you got the altitude, and you're going to land either on the grass or behind you. Sail before steam, right? What's that? Sail before steam, right? In theory. Right away. In theory. So what are you going to do? You've made the call, but that person in that Mooney says, I'm here first, I'm landing. What are you going to do? Don't is go around, pick the grass. So okay, and uh, that person says, go around, screw you. I'm from Texas, I'm landing. <laughs> Whatever's required to do it safely. Okay. We have the grass. Okay. So, you said required to do it safely, you said something about the grass. What are your options at that point? Your eyes are so you don't have a lot of <laughs> <laughs> Can you land on the taxiway? Yes. 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 The taxiway, yes. the grass. grass. The grass. Taxiway, and then there's also, as a third option, maybe there's a field on the other side of the taxiway, which is less preferable, but it's there. Okay, yeah. But those are the things you have to, you should think about. You know, what are you going to do? And now, you know, what if you're, you know, going Blue Angel, you know, head-to-head -head pass on base legs? What are you going to do? <laughs> Where's that? Hey, question. Ian, are you, can you give me your experience with that cub that you had a potential conflict with there that time? Oh, yeah. I didn't have a radio, and so I was coming in like headlong in the 126 and there's a lot of wind so I just extended my base and I didn't quite make it back to the runway but I landed just short of the light box but everything ended up fine. Because there was a cub coming in direct head to head with you right? Yep. Okay. So if your outcome was good do you think that if you had thought about it before you might have had a better outcome? Staying right. Yeah maybe. Okay. Did he do anything wrong? No. I think in that case, was he not aware of your presence? Yeah. I think that yeah. was, I think, okay. yeah. I had no way of radioing in, because the radio wasn't working, and I also didn't have an altimeter, but, so. Uh, I, re I recall that the ground, somebody from ground I was, was yeah. communicating I was, with that cub. Yeah. And, uh, I don't remember the detail, I remember the day. I yeah, don't remember that nice detail, but I was, I was <laughs> on the radio yeah. trying to, yeah. trying to wave them off, but I don't remember if they had a radio either. Yeah. 
Okay. So. I'm not trying to pick on you because you had a good outcome and everything was safe. But what I would highly encourage you to do is say, what decisions did I make? Why did I make them? Could I have made better decisions? Could I have made poor decisions? Mm -hmm. And evaluate what you've done. Because you saw that cup there, you know, again, you could put it on the taxiway, you could do whatever. You had a good outcome, so you did good. But again, critically assess yourself, back like what Dr. Deming is saying, and see what you're doing. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Any other landing issues that you might? Something we went over, which I think was was uh, was a good change, is um, Jeff uh, Curtis. Are you still in training, trying to make sure that you get a few landings in with students on the grass at some point? Yes. Yeah. Because there was a time when we were almost exclusively landing students on the pavement always, and students could get to the point where they got licensed and had never had a grass landing, mm -hmm. and it came up that it would have been handy for some at some point for. Uh, for a student in the Rolodex <laughs> to have the experience of landing on the grass a few times so that in that moment when there's a decision to be, in that moment where there's a deconfliction, maybe even Ian's example, you know, if you hadn't felt like you needed or it was, it was, uh, there was a need to extend, which you can't really do in a glider, right? Yeah. I mean, for the most part. If you had felt like, hey, I have the confidence to go to the grass, you know, he's on the pavement, he's just far enough ahead of me, I can go into the grass. So what we've been doing is what we did since then is we made a decision to have our training include one or more grass landings for a student, just so it's in your Rolodex. You know, it's an option to turn to if you need it, and so on. So that's an example where we, you know, we took a a problem that happened, we turned it into a training change to make sure that that experience was in our students' toolbox. Yeah, that's awesome. So okay, so one last thing, and then we'll be done with this. You're normally supposed to come across the high school, come across and land. Do you practice getting your student low, your learner low over here, and then having what they do? Say that you, the wind is out of the whatever, the north, and you're thermaling. Now you find yourself a thousand feet AGL over here. What do you teach your learners to do? Do you teach them to go over to the high school, to the IP, and yeah. fly the pattern, or do you teach them to enter a left down, a left base? Modified pattern. Get in. I can yeah. modify. Yeah. It goes straight across. Isabel, did you know how to do that? I haven't done it yet. Okay. Okay. We highly recommend that on flight three, flight four, you show them that. Show them that's an option. And then when you get up into the mid teens and the twenties, you have them actually go do it. To realize that, yeah, the bottom's not gonna fall out. Steve's not going to tell us you can't fly here anymore. It's something that if we have to do it, we do it. We make it acceptable, okay? But I highly recommend that you say, we're going to find ourselves a little bit low down here, and we're going to fly a modified pattern and show them that they can do it, okay? If you see that they can do it, and they see that there's a positive outcome, and they see that the leadership is not upset with them, find themselves in that situation for real, are they going to do it correctly? Or are they more likely to do it correctly? Yes. Okay? So cool. So that's a little way to feel. We talked about that. Uh, Steve had talked about that you guys want to talk about, uh, you've had a couple of incidents here, and you might have some questions and maybe get my perspective. Is that what you would like to do? Uh, yeah, we, we can, uh, just to uh, generically describe that. You know, one was um, uh, we took off with... Uh, with our uh, tail dolly and uh, wing outrigger on. And, uh, and one was uh, we got low over the ridge and got surprised by the sink over the river and the headwind and uh, you know, high performance glider and uh, didn't make it back to the field. Uh, and on that second one, um, so surprised that he was planning to fly a normal uh, pattern and kept that in his brain for too long and then when he went direct uh, he was too low and, and went into the into the power lines just to the uh, north uh, east of the uh, numbers there so um, I think we sort of kind of know what happened with both of those and I don't know that we need to you know you ask for lessons learned on them um, I think I think you have covered them actually is what okay. I'm going to say all right uh, yeah okay
Uh, good. All right. Well, that's pretty much all I've got. If there's any questions, uh, I think you've seen enough. Sir. Your thoughts on uh, requiring spin training prior to solo? Absolutely. 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 You have thoughts or you think you should? Yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you. You're Absolutely. Listening. I have thoughts. <laughs> okay. Uh, intentional spinning is encouraged. Uh, if you've never seen it, how do you know that you're in it? Okay. The FARs require that if you're going to be an instructor, you have to have had received training in spins. How do I know Isabel's not going to be an instructor? So I'm going to give her tr spin training real early so that five years from now when she's like, what, 16? <laughs> <laughs> you're that, too, you're there's, too, there's, you're, there's that lady math again. Yeah, she's too smart <laughs> to be 15 years old. But I highly recommend it so that, you know, you, you're out as, well, she may be an instructor, so we're going to do spin training. Okay. Uh, related to that is the difference between a spin and a spiral dive. Okay, so what is the difference? Right, in a spiral dive, your wings are loading up. In a spin, they're not. There's okay. One, one wing installed in a spin. Okay, so where is, what's happening to your angle of bank, your yaw, and your pitch when you're in a spin? In a spin, everything is basically the same concept. When you're in a spin, no. You've got one wing installed, my nose is going down, and remember, when you're in a spin, your axis of rotation is out in front of you. So to get from over here to over here, I have to do a 180 degree turn and I have to roll 90 degrees. So I'm moving around the outside of a cone. So I'm constantly rolling and yawing as I'm going around the cone. You know what a fugoid oscill oscillation is? Yes. So you're yawing, you're rolling, and you're pitching as you're moving around the outside of that cone. When you're in an inverted spin, where's the axis of rotation? You mean inverted or spiral? Right. Inverted spin. Ouch. It's behind me. Okay, so that's different. Now, when you're in a spiral dive, what's happening? Are, is the wing flying? No, yeah, it's flying. It's loading up. Right? It's flying. It's loading up. Where's your pitch attitude? Is it going down or is it coming back up? It's going down. It's going down. What's happening to your airspeed? It's going up. It's going up. <laughs> so, when you're in a spin, is your airspeed? What's it doing? It's basically constant. It's basically constant. Okay. When you're in a spin, the weight of the aircraft is equal to the drag of the aircraft falling forward. Okay? And the rotational energy that's moving around is from the wing to lift on that. Everything shifts 90 degrees. Okay? And why is it, why is it rotating? Well, because one wing is generating lift and one is stopped. Oh, yeah, maybe. Sometimes. One wing is generating one wing is generally more stalled more. than the other wing. And so you're creating differential lift, differential drag. If I've got a stalled wing, does it make a little bit of drag or a lot of drag? A lot of drag. A lot of drag, so it's going around. Okay? And because it's moving around, you do all the vector sums and everything, the <laughs> gliders, the, the aircraft is pitched up. Have you ever noticed when you do a spin, when you stop the rotation, what happens to the nose without you doing anything? Does it want to come up or does it want to fall down? Yeah. It falls down because it no longer has that rotation that's forcing it up. Okay? I see a lot of odd faces out there. Trust me, when you stop, it pitches down. Now you have to pitch further forward to get the wing unstalled, to get the speed, now to start your recovery. Secondary stalls, the rotation has stopped. Now it's pitching down. Oh my God, it's pitching down. What do you do? You pull back. You pull back. Okay, which does what? Oh, well, stalls it again, and off you go the other way. <laughs> okay, again, the aircraft did exactly what you told it to do. Okay, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I was just basically, I'm, I'm, I'm of the camp that people need to have spin training, and I seem to be in a minority here, so I was kind of wondering what your thoughts were. Well, yeah. uh, when I went into Navy flight training, I was used to doing spins to a heading. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stall, and I'm going to recover on that heading. I got the T-34, they said, you're going to better the spin, you're going to, get, you're going to see that you're spinning, you're going to neutralize, analyze, you're going to put your anti-spin controls in, and two and a half to three turns later, you're going to recover. <laughs> so, brain dead ensign, I stall, okay, here we go, this is cool, okay, recover. Nothing happened. We went around once. Now I'm starting to get that sweat. We go around a second time, now I'm starting to panic about two and a half times, it shudders a little bit and comes out. 
And I recover, and the instructor goes, great job, TJ, let's do another. I'm going, oh my god. <laughs> OK? Because I knew it was going to happen, but I didn't know it was going to happen. And that's the same thing in a spin. You go up and practice it, and then learn about what you're doing. So that when it does happen, when it starts to auto-rotate on you, you know that you're about to enter a spin. Highly encourage it. What, is, what does your office say about teaching spins? I don't think we've talked about it uh, a lot. OK. Is that something you dictate to your instructors, or do they say, well, Steve, I'm not sure we want to do that? No, it's uh, up to them. I think uh, one of the issues is an aircraft where you want to go out and spin. Okay. Uh, our uh, 32 will spin. Um, I'm not sure the K-21 or the Marco. If you put the spin weights on it, it'll spin nicely. Yeah. Uh, if you get something really light in a Grove 103, it'll spin and it might not come out. Uh, so you want to be very careful about that. Uh, but you know, you can teach the basics by putting it up and it starts to go and it starts to auto rotate and then you say, okay, recover. You don't have to put it into a fully developed spin, sir. I don't think the club has any restrictions about who can rent what, do they? I mean, no. So here we get a kid that's never spun and he wants to take his friend up in the 232. I say, no way. Mm -hmm. But it's not written in the, to the restriction. Okay. Isn't insurance also a factor? Like I, I know with, with Atlanta, we are not able to do spin training, ex but there is an exception with the insurance to cover instructors, or, or instructor candidates who become CFIGs. Yes, and that's per the FAR. So Isabel's going to be an instructor in four years, so she needs to get her spin training now. <laughs> and she needs to practice it more and more. Okay? Uh, <laughs> Interesting. I, I know you can do spin training with Condor. Yes. It works. Okay. If you mess up, you hit Q. Okay. <laughs> 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 and again, I guarantee you feel different. <laughs> you know, what are your spin control? What are your spin recovery procedures? Okay, is that something that you might find in the pilot operating handbook? Yeah. Generically, neutralize the controls, analyze which way it's going, put the anti-spin controls in the pilot operating handbook in, and wait for it to recover. But if, how do I know that I'm spinning to the left? Everything else is going <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's very disorienting because I'm rolling, I'm pitching, and I'm yawing. Okay? Which way will the off streak be if I am spinning to the left? So the string will go off to the right, or it'll be pointing to the right? It makes a big arrow. You're spinning this way. You know, like. Is telling you to put a whole boot full of left rudder in because the wind is coming across from your left side because you're yawing so much to the left. So it's telling you you need to have left rudder to be coordinated. So it makes a big arrow. You're spinning that way. So neutralize the controls, analyze what's going on. Oh, I'm spinning that way. I need to get right rudder in and start your recovery. Does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe? Have you guys had enough? I think they've had enough. <laughs> so one thing before we leave, this is an actual real thing here. They don't show this in Top Gun, but this is called Steel Beach. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and they give you one beer at deployment or two beers at deployment that you can drink and sit in your pool or on your on your bath out on play. Anyway. Yeah. So Tom, that was perfect. Uh, big hand for uh, <laughs> And uh, we're definitely going to have you back next year, and hopefully we have not contributed to your statistics. And if we haven't, it's a lot is owed to you. So thank you very much for coming out and doing this. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for all your input. It was great. Okay, so we're done except for one reminder. Fill out your Hood River Soaring Proficiency Plan. Right? Go back and do that. I'll be watching. And again, the, the, oh, and, and the new term, our learners do not have to fill it out, but all licensed pilots uh, and everybody else have to. Also, as, as past president, I'll pull, pull a small bit of, of rank here and just uh, so I stand up and say, yeah. first of all, this is one of the first times we've all gotten together as a group since the time of troubles, and I really uh, enjoy seeing 
uh, all of you here. Um, secondly, what a great thing to have so many Willamette Valley people here with us today. Uh, Alex and I were just talking about that. And uh, I, I love the fact that we are doing some of these things together and, and, and sharing this stuff together, flying together, doing these things together. It's great. So uh, I thank you for that. I want to encourage more of that.